Praise the name of the Most High. Welcome to Hebrew Institute Live on this glorious, glorious day. Do you know what an Am Sebula is? That's a peculiar treasure. Let me ask you, do I have any peculiar treasures in the house today? Come on now. Hallelujah. Glory to God. All right, we're going to go ahead and uh, uh, get started. Uh, Marcia, you can go ahead and get started. And I may click my screen off for a minute because I need to print off my lesson. All right, guys, go ahead. And Marcia Austin, please, a powerful prayer. We need a powerful prayer on this powerful day. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Father. Glory to God, Father. We praise you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Adonai. Blessed is your name forever and ever, for you are worthy. You are worthy to be praised and lifted on high. Father, thank you for this today, this Shabbat, Father. Thank you for bringing us together again, Father, just to be with you, to hear from you, to be in your presence, Father God. Father, you said how wonderful it is, Father, for brethren to dwell together in unity, Father God. And we are unified as one body under you, Father. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Father, we thank you for the word that you're bringing to us this day, Father God, which will enlighten us and direct our path, Father God. Thank you for the Torah, Father God. Lord, we couldn't make it without you, Father God. We are thankful for your word, Father, for you are the word. You are our light, Father God. Father, we lift up Israel, Father God. We pray, Father God, Lord, for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding for Israel, Father God, to end this war, Father God, that you show them what they need to do, Father God. Father, your mercy is towards Israel, Father God. And we're praying, Father, for those uh, men and women and children who are held in captivity, Father God, that they will be released, that you will stop the mouth of the wicked, Father God. We pray, Father God, Lord, for this country that we're living in, Father God, we are here, Father God, in this light, Father God, that we are a light in this world, in this dark generation, Father God, that you lift us up, Father God, that this country, Father God, will turn to you again. It's not too late, Father God, that they will turn back, Father God, and walk the way that you would have us to walk, Father. I thank you, Father God, for each and every one of us on the line of the Yeshiva, those of us who are in Torah, Father God, who are submitted to your word, to your covenant, Father God, that we are the light, Father God, a light, Father God, in this wicked world, Father. So thank you for what you are doing, O oh God. Father, I pray that, God, for those of us, Israel, who are dispersed throughout the nations, Father God, that you are with us, will uphold our hands continually, Father God, and protect us and keep us, Father God. Many of us, Father God, are in different wars all over the world, Father God, fighting a fight, Father God, Lord, but only you alone can deliver. So, Father, thank you for healing us where we need to be healed and lifting us up, Father God. We thank you for your loving arm, protecting us and watching us, Father yeah. God. Some of us are tired and weary, Father God, but you, Lord God, are our strength and our shield, Father, the lifter of our heads and our hands. And with you, Father God, we know that we are strong. We know we can do valiantly, Father God. Thank you for your goodness, Father. We thank you that Pastor Israel and all the uh, other, others of us who had went, Father God, to see the men, and uh, not women, but just the men there this time, Father God, that you will, Father God, lift up these men, young men, Father God, and help them, Father God. Help them not to forget, Father God, that you are a God who would heal and deliver and set free, Father God. Thank you for taking care, Father God, of these young men, Father God. Thank you for your mercy towards your children. Father, we love you, Lord God. And we thank you for all that you do in our lives daily, Father God. Thank you for your goodness. Amen. 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 Well, we did go to the youth facility today, and uh, it was a really great. We had, I think it was, what, 48 youth and about 10, I think it was 10 or, or, or more of the staff that was there. And I want to thank uh, um uh, Brad and uh, Rich and Alina, you know, who came and everything. We're still missing you, Ed and Connie. All right. Waiting for you to come back soon and any any of you others. But I'd like to take a moment and for those who were there to give a testimonial of, of what you uh, observed with the kids and everything. Who wants to start? Uh, uh, Brad, you want to start? Yeah, I can start. Um. I, I really liked how you uh, broke down the, the you know, the Ten Commandments. I don't think you've ever gotten that deep 
with them before there's a youth facility to kind of each one and kind of explain, uh, you know, what that could be and this kind of stuff. But I, I do think that they were able to he, easily, easily understand it. And that, you, you know, the youth had a, a you know, you know, they, that they were really res, uh, responsive and they were like, you know, you know, they were, uh, you know, they were being interactive and they, they, they understood it. And I just look like just how you, you know, how you handled all that there. And, and it's useful for even us too, like, you know, to hear, you know, to hear it over, you know, some stuff on, you know, what this is. And so it was awesome. And uh, yeah, I give them all the glory, honor, and praise. Praise, but Brad set it up with that song, the first song, and then we just kind of went in with each other. Thank you for that sneeze, Jenny. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate it. But it was, it, I mean, it. let me tell you how God operates. When you are walking, when you have a, not a walk with God, but walking with him and the weekly Torah portions, it was in my mind to teach them on the, uh, Ten Commandments today, because that's what we're studying. That's what our Torah portion is. So, you know, I was more or less instructed, bring them in to Mount Sinai, bring them in with you so that they can see exactly what it is you are seeing, experience it exactly the way Yeshua would have been experiencing it and all of that. So that's what, you know, I had in my mind to do yesterday. You know, it's like, Lord, just show me how to do it for them and everything. So we get to the facility and it just so happens that they tell me, oh, by the way, uh, um, uh, Dr. Phillips is going to be here with the with the Shroud of Turin. And it was like, what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so it's like, oh, I won't get a chance. Well, you can do that to Ten Canat Mammoths another time. So 8.30 comes. He's supposed to be there between 8.30 and 9. No Dr. Phillips, quarter to nine. No Dr. Phillips. So uh, Tom goes out. And uh, he uh, finds out that Dr. Phillips will not be coming because he's sick. And it's like, see, we make plans and God laughs. When God has a plan, okay, and we can't mess it up. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I know he had put it on my heart to do that today. And so I had the opportunity because the speaker they had Okay, was not coming. He's going to come next month, which is when I thought he was coming in the first place. So God just worked it out. Okay. And he also worked it out so that, and I hate to say this, all the kids didn't come. You know, so sometimes we have a full house, but all the kids didn't come. But that was part of the lesson because not all the nations were under Mount Sinai. It was only a group a special group. So I was able to break that down for them, you know, with some scriptures and, and Brad, you know, the way of uh, doing that was, you know, from that scripture that was on the board, okay, in the lunchroom about, you know, the word being their path. So knowing that, and here's the whole thing, guys, the reason that I love for you to come, because we are not just witnessing to the youth. We are witnessing to the workers that are there, and we are wit witnessing to those who are coming who are not in Torah. You understand what I'm saying? So the ministry, the youth ministry, is not just fixing breakfast for those kids, because that message is going to go out to each and every one, okay, who was there, through each and every one who was there. And it's important that those who are there also understand the reason why we are in the Torah. And I think they're beginning to a little bit more and a little bit more, you know, just by the reactions, okay, that they were, uh, that they were having. And so one of the things, did you notice the young man whose family was a Christian, he was adopted, okay? There is a difference between being, okay, in Christ, and having Christ in you. Because you can have all this on the outside. 
You can have Torah on the outside. You can have church on the outside. You can go to every prayer meeting. You can go to every service. But if what is in this book is not in you, okay, it's not going to make a bit of difference, you know, because here we are all there, okay, and you have those who profess to be believers in Messiah. But what does that mean? And, and Brad, that's why I broke that down the way I did, because the young man whose youth minister, he was very involved in the youth ministry, said his youth minister said all the commandments can be, you know, summarized into love the Lord thy God and love thy neighbor as thyself. And so I asked him, what does that mean? How do you do that? And that is the reason why we broke it down. The Ten Commandments talk about how you love the Lord thy God, how you love your neighbor as yourself, and then all the rest of them. And they needed to understand that, you know. And the way that God gave it to me was to bring them into the commandments because this is one thing that we kind of miss. The commandments that he gives at Mount Sinai are with the understanding that this is how we are going to act when we come out of the house of bondage, but get into the promised land. You understand what I'm saying? So it's not enough just to come out of the house of bondage. What are you going to do when you get to that place God has for you? How are you going to act? How are you going to act with your neighbor? How are you going to act for, with God? And why were those first three so important? Because he was taking them, okay, taking them to a land that was going to have many gods. So it's all about relationship. And yesterday, this is what he impressed upon me to bring to your attention. When Moses rolls up in Egypt and introduces Yahweh, he says, I, Yahweh says, I am Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of your father, Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. When they come out, okay, of Egypt, did you notice I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out? Of, the, of Egypt out of the land of bondage. You never, we never pay attention to that. First, I am Yahweh, their God. After they come out of Egypt, I am now Yahweh, your God. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew me by the name of El Shaddai. They experienced me by the name of El Shaddai. El Shaddai is the one who made the promises. El Shaddai is the one who gave them the wealth. But Yahweh is the one who will be deliverer and the one to take them into the land. So there is a difference in experience or a difference in relationship. That is why you have the two ways to introduce him. I am Yahweh, God of your fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then I am Yahweh, your God. And see, when we come to the name Yeshua, all right, we shall know him as Yahweh, our Savior. You understand? Yahweh has become our salvation. So it is so important to understand how those names relate to different phases in the relationship that Yah will have with his people. He is no longer just the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all right? So if, if I'm relating to someone, who's your God, all right? Who's your God? Is he, who are, who's your father? Remember what we, oh, we should always ask, who are the church fathers? Mm -hmm. yeah. Because our fathers are who? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Moses, those are our church fathers. But if someone comes to you and says, Luther, Eusebius, all of that, okay, you right there know there is a different split 
in their understanding of what it is you believe about God. And like I always say, if Eusebius and Luther and all of them are the fathers of Christianity, how come they were born centuries after the first church? How are you going to be the daddy of something that created you? <laughs> okay, <laughs> it doesn't happen that way. So it's important because when you say that, it causes a person to think, what is it that I believe? So if I believe I am a Lutheran, if I believe I am a Methodist, those branches of Christianity came thousands of years after, hundreds, hundreds of years after the birth of the first church, which is why you have such of a variation in between what it is we say we believe and what it is they say they believe. So now you've got to bring commonality. You've got to bring them back into the fold, okay? And how I presented this Bible is the Bible is a GPS. You know where you are when you put the coordinates in. But there is a place you need to get to that you don't know how to get to from where you are presently. The Bible is that GPS. Why? Because the GPS will always, always has an endpoint. Our endpoint is with, is with Yeshua. So we know the endpoint. And the Bible is the GPS to tell us how to get there. God orders our steps in his word. Okay, Psalm number 119, 133. Order my steps in your word. Okay, and so our steps are ordered, which is why we are here today. We are here today around Mount Sinai. We are listening to the thundering, the lightning, the excitement of God as he calls us his Amsegula, that treasured people. You are treasured. As you are looking in this screen, you can see yourself in this screen. That's why I like the images on, because as you look at yourself, you need to say, wow, I'm a peculiar treasure. Look, look at me, look at me, I'm a treasure. Wow. Look at my pose on. I'm a treasure. Okay, you can pose, Wonder Woman folks. I'm a treasure. Okay, look at Lena. She's a treasure. Grace, a treasure. Okay, her me, a treasure. You are not only treasured, you are a treasure. You understand? Don't let anyone define who you are. Allow God to define you are. And if he says you are my peculiar treasure, then it doesn't matter what your boss thinks. Let me tell you something. It doesn't even matter what your husband or wife says. Okay? Okay? Be, uh, what, what you look at Ed like that for, Connie? <laughs> okay? <laughs> because, Connie, you are Ed's treasure. Okay? Let me straighten that out. And, and Ed, you are Connie's treasure. Okay? And you both together are Yahweh's peculiar treasure. You understand that? So when you look at each other, you see treasure, nothing there, something of value, okay? If God values you, you are valued, the creator of the heavens and the earth. So as we learn a lot more today, Ed's going to go over, I think, the last uh, half of the commandments. I am probably going to go over women in the ministry or women in the first century church, okay? Because you need that history because guess what? Stephen says the church began in the wilderness, okay? So today's lesson is actually the beginning of the church where we are called together as that called out assembly, called out of darkness. Egypt is darkness into his marvelous light. So we need to know how the church was founded from the beginning because today's church looks a lot different than it did back then. Even with different denominations, they look a lot different than they did back in the days that Yeshua, okay, that Yeshua was alive. So we're going to learn about that also today. So, okay, I don't have my schedule up. I have to go Pastor, get it. So uh, Pastor, I just wanted to add. Oh, yes, Lena, go ahead. 
what I learned or what I was observing when we went into when you were uh, telling them about Ten Commandments, a lot of kids were really, really listening this time, I noticed. Because some of them, they fidget and they play with each other with their finger or their foot and stuff like that. Most of them were sitting and just listening to you how you explain the Ten Commandments, who, who their God is if they do certain things. And I believe that they know now who, how to kind of follow the instruction you gave them from the Bible, not from yourself, but from the Bible. And you had the kids, certain kids reading the, the scripture also, and you explained what the scripture said to them. And, and one kid was just sitting there in the back with his head down, but by the time you start explaining certain scripture in the Bible, he starts sitting up and looking at you for, I think, because he was just sitting down with his head down, and then he sat up and start listening to you. And also the fact that uh, you explain what, you know, the the uh, Torah is to us. It's our life. We're, uh, we, we're, we are reborn from, from being dead all these years when we didn't believe in the Lord. So they kind of understand all that stuff. So, And it was a good teaching for me too. Thank you. Praise God. Praise God. All right. All right. Well, we have the schedule. I don't have it up. I'm going to go run and get it. Uh, who is first? Hallelujah. Shabbat Shalom. All right. From Tampa, I'll be reading Matthew 5, 21 through 30. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and who shall, whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that, they, that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly, while thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost fathering, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on the woman to lust, after hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right hand offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that they whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offendeth thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thy that one of thy members should perish, and that and not that they thy whole body should be cast into hell. Shabbat shalom. For me, Shabbat shalom. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Uh, uh, yes. I'm re reading from the messianic. Jewish Family Bible, and uh, I'll be reading from Romans 2, 17 through 29. But if you call yourself Jewish and be rely upon the Torah and boast in God and know his will and determine what matters because you are instructed from the Torah, and you are sure that you are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, 
having in the Torah the embodiment of knowledge and the truth, you then who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach not to steal, do you steal? Do you say not to commit adultery? Do you commit adultery? You who detest idols, do you rob temp temples? You who take pride in the Torah through your violation of the Torah, do you with dishonor Yahweh or Elohim? For as it is written, the name of Elohim is slandered among the nations because of you. Circumcision is indeed worthwhile if you keep the Torah. But if you break the Torah, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcised keeps the righteous decrees of the Torah, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? Indeed, the one not circumcised physically who fulfills the Torah will judge you who even with the written Torah, Torah and circumcision break the Torah. For one is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision something visible in the flesh. Rather, the Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart, in spirit, not in letter. His praise is not from men, but from Elohim. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. This is Katrina from North Carolina. I should be reading Ephesians 6, 1 through 3. Children, obey your parents in Yahweh, for this is the right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Shabbat Shalom. Miss Sherry? Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat shalom. I'm, I'm going to be reading 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 14. Here is a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. He must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? Is that okay. He must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. In the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep of the deep truth of faith with a clear conscience. They must be first tested, and then if there's nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife, must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Jesus Christ. Although I hope to see you soon, I am writing to you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of truth. All right, let's go back to verse number 11. Can you read that again, verse number 11? Sure. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. Okay, this is, uh, do you know what translation that is by any chance? So this is NIV. Do you want the... um? Uh, no, no, no. I wanted to make a point there with that. That okay. word for women in um in the Greek, the word gune, K 
can be either women or wives. Women meaning all women or wives are what? A particular woman who is married to a particular husband. What that word, how you use that word is based upon the context of the scriptures. So when in verse 11, when they say, and so must the women, okay, that's taking that scripture out of context because he's talking about husbands, okay? He's talking about one who's going to be what a deacon or whatever of the church, all right? And then he's talking about his wife because it says in the King James, and even so much their wives be grave as opposed to all of a sudden flipping and okay, all women, then we get back to husbands again, which is one reason why I want to teach on the, how the first century church was uh, set up because people have this idea that Paul changed a whole lot of things within the church and he didn't. It is our misunderstanding because of how certain things were deliberately translated or mistranslated in the Bible. But see, you let the Bible, okay, always interpret itself, which is why we study the Bible culturally. We study it historically and we study it biblically also. Okay, one of the big things about being an overseer, where in this chapter do you see anything about women? I mean, women in an overseer or all of these criteria. You don't, right? So you automatically assume that women are not to be in the ministry, right? Mm -hmm. You would assume that. Right. But here's the problem with that. When he's going on the qualifications of an overseer, telling him he must be the husband of one wife and whatsoever, okay? Those are things that had to be put in there. A woman could never have more than one husband. A woman was always at home. You understand what I'm saying? It didn't need to be said for women because these, these you know, uh, things did not apply to them. All right. So a woman couldn't have more than one husband. However, there was a time when a man could have more than one wife. Mm -hmm. You see, so this is why I say, okay, if he says that the believer, okay, only has who is a man who is in the ministry, only one wife, why do some of these I'm trying to be nice. I'm really trying. I'm trying. God, you see how hard I'm trying to be nice. Some of these denominations, because I was going to say demon nations, okay, denominations, or some of these newer Hebrew Israelite movements prescribed to having more than one wife. It's okay to have more than one wife. You see, that's not what the commandment here says. Now, remember, these are epistles. They are epistles. And what is Paul doing? He's giving instruction to Timothy. Why is he giving these instructions to Timothy? Did anyone ever figure, why is he giving these instructions to Timothy? Because Timothy is going out to the Gentiles. Those that were Jews in the church didn't need these. Okay, instructions, because under Torah, you are only at this point going to have one wife. You are only going to be doing certain things. So the Gentiles, however, were all over the place. So he's giving them instructions. If you are going to make this, okay, Gentile, or you're going to these churches, this is how you set things in order. So that's why it's so important to understand who is talking, number one. Who are they talking to? Who is their target audience? When you are reading the scriptures, it's important for you to understand that. And okay, remember who Timothy is. Timothy's mother was and grandmother were Jewish, which is why Paul, not, yeah, Paul, okay, had him circumcised because he was going to be with what? Jews and Gentiles. As a Jew, he should have been circumcised, okay, on the eighth day. Now, 
Here's another thing. Because his mother was a Jew. If we go all the way back to Ezra and Nehemiah, when did that come in about the mother being a Jew? You being determined by your mother, not the father. Father may determine tribe, but based upon Ezra, remember when they came back, okay, from the exile, all of those who had married foreign wives had to divorce the wife and leave the wife and those children. Mm -hmm. You see, so it wasn't based upon the father, whether it was based upon the mother, the mother's status, which is the way it is even today. Okay, when you go before the Orthodox Jews, okay, over in Israel, okay, they want to know who mama and grandma are. Okay, if grandma's not alive, where is she buried? Who is she? Okay, father, okay, when you have some of the other more progressive, the progressive, okay, uh, denominations, I want to say denominations, because that's familiar to everyone, like you're reformed and all of that, then you have different criteria, okay, that they may, that they may uh, um, allow and everything, but we see that going back to Okay, all the way back to the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. But no, there were no prescriptions or no, you know, uh, uh, instructions that were given to women because women were, okay, women were, once again, what were women? They were not allowed to have more than one husband. They were the caretakers of the home, which is why you see Paul, Paul had a lot of churches that were what? run by women that were run by women the book of corinthians all of that you know you have phoebe okay who is instructed to give the letter to the romans so we'll learn a little bit more about that later i just wanted to bring that up with that chapter okay who do we have next i think we have boise yes uh shabbat shalom this is boise from north carolina i'll be reading titus chapter one verses five through nine for this course left I thee increase, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I have appointed thee. If any be blameless the husband of one wife, having faithful children who are accused of riot, not accused of riot or unruly. For a bishop must be blameless, as the steward of Elohim, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, nor no striker, nor given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayer. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Ray. Shalom. I'll be reading Hebrews 12, 18 through 29. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded, and if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dot, and so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But ye are come unto a Mount Sinai, and unto the city of the living Elohim, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to Elohim, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Yeshua, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that, dis 
that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that ye refuse not him that speak, for if they escape not who refuse him that speak on earth much more, shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven? Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he had promised, saying, Yea, once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signify the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve Elohim acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our Elohim is a consuming fire. Renee? Yes, ma'am. Shabbat Shalom. This is Renee from North Carolina, and I'll be coming from the JPS Tanakh, reading Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 13. In the year that King Uzziah died, I beheld my Adonai seated on a high and lofty throne, and the skirts of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs stood in attendance on him. Each of them had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his legs. And with two, he would fly. And one would call to the other, Kadosh, 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 holy, holy, Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. His presence fills all the earth. The doorposts would shake at the sound of the one who called, and the house kept filling with smoke. I cried, I cried, I cried. Woe is me. I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my own eyes have beheld the king, Yahweh Sabaoth, then come one of the seraphs flew over to me with a live coal, which he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched it to my lips and declared, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt shall depart and your sin be purged away. Then I heard the voice of my Adonai saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for me? And I said, Hanani, here I am. Here am I, send me. And he said, go, say to that people, hear indeed, but do not understand. See indeed, but do not grasp. Dull that people's mind, stop its ears and seal its eyes. Lest seeing with its eyes and hearing with its ears, it also grasps with its mind and repents and save itself. I asked, how long my Adonai? And he replied, till towns lie waste without inhabitants and houses without people and the ground lies waste and desolate for Yahweh will banish the population and deserted sites are many in the midst of the land. But while a tenth part yet remains in it, it shall repent. It shall be ravished like the terebinth and the oak of which strangers are left even when they are failed, its stump shall be a kadosh, a holy seed. Shabbat shalom, Miss Jenny. Shabbat shalom. My fire will consume the works of witchcraft and occultism. Hey. Do not turn away from me to serve other gods. For if you turn your children away from me to serve other gods, my anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. Break down the altars of witchcraft and burn any occultic idols in the fire. For you are a people holy to me. I have chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be my people, my treasured possession. Mm -hmm. Do not test my promises to you and turn to witchcraft and idols. For I will cause a fire to consume your wickedness just as I did with the children of Israel. Lord, release your fire and burn up the idols of this land. 
Let the works of witchcraft and occultism be burned in your fire. Let your flame be kindled against wicked spirits and let demons be exposed and cast out with your fire. Amen. I will destroy the works of lust and perversion. My child, don't be fooled. Anyone who keeps on sinning belongs to the devil. He has sinned from the beginning, but my son came to destroy all that he has done. If anyone loves the world, my love is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of me, but is of the world. The world is passing away and the lust of it. When you ask why the land perishes and burns up like a wilderness so that no one can pass through, I will respond because you have forsaken my law, which I set before you and have not obeyed my voice nor walked according to it. Therefore, I will scatter those who do the works of lust and perversion and will send a sword after them until I have consumed them. Let the spirits of lust and perversion be destroyed with your fire. Pass through the land and burn up all wickedness and perversion from out of it. The world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides, abides forever. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. This is Lena. I'll be reading portion summary and this week in Bible history. Portion summary. The 17th reading from the Torah is named Yitro, which is the literal Hebrew behind the name Jethro. The title comes from the first word of the first verse of the reading, which says, Now Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard all of heard of all that God has done for Moses and for Israel, his people. Exodus chapter 18, verse 1. The portion tells the story of Jethro's visit to the camp of Israel, then relates the great theophany at Mount Sinai, where God gives Israel the Ten Commandments and invites the people to enter a special covenant relationship with him. This week in Bible history, Asher born, Shavat 20, 1562 BCE. Asher, the son of Jacob, was born on the 20th of Shavat of the year 2199 from creation, 1562 BCE. <clears throat> According to some account, this is also the date of his passing. War on Benjamin, or Benjamin, Chevette 23, circa 1228 BCE. Armies of the tribes of Israel converged upon the tribe of Benjamin in the aftermath of the concubine at Giva incident in a war which nearly brought about the extinction of the Benjamite, as related in the book of Jud Judges, chapter 19 through chapter 21. The event occurred during the judgeship of Othanel ben Kenaz, who led the people of Israel in the years 2533 to 2573 from creation, 1228 to 1188 BCE. Zechariah's prophecy, the Shevet 24, 351 BCE, on the 24th day of the 11th month which is the month of Shavet, in the second year of the reign of Darius, the word of God came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Ido, the prophet, saying, I will return to Jerusalem in mercy. My house will be built within her, and the Lord shall yet console Zion and shall choose Jerusalem. Zechariah chapter 1, verses 7 through 17. This was two years before the completion of the second temple on the 3rd of Adar, 3412, 349 BCE. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. This is Ed in Tampa. Today's reading is the 10 words. We're going to concentrate on words 5 through 10. Harold, let me do a bit of an introduction here. 
First of all, the term Ten Commandment is not accurate in Hebrew and should be referred to as the Ten Utterances or Ten Words. And the division and arrangement of commandments may vary according to different religious traditions. The term Ten Commandments is not accurate in Hebrew because the word for commandment is mitzvah, or Strong's H4687, mitzvah. And the correct term is Ten Utterances or Ten Words. The Ten Commandments function in a most special way within Holy Scripture. You may not be aware that they are never actually called Ten Commandments, but rather Eseret Ha Devarim, the Ten Words. We find this in Exodus 34, 28, where it says, And he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights, and he wrote down on tablets the terms of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Obviously, the Hebrew is indicating that this is much more than just a list of 10 individual words. Rather, they are 10 unique divine utterances, unique in several ways. First of all, the 10 words were only part of God's revelation to Moses that was given to him in direct hearing of the people. We find this in Exodus 20, 18 to 21, where it says, And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said to Moses, speak thou with us and we will hear, but not do not let God speak with us and let us we die. And Moses said unto the people, fear not, for God has come to prove you that his fear may be before your faces that you sin not. And the people stood afar off and Moses drew near into the thick darkness where God was. It isn't clear if they heard the actual words, but whatever they heard, they were so terrified they never wanted to experience that again. Second of all, Moses received the word of God. Only these 10 words were written by God's only own finger. In fact, he did it twice. Due to Moses destroying the first set in reaction to Israel's rebellious activities while he was with God on the mountain, we find that in Exodus 31, 18, where it says that, and he gave unto Moses, which he made an end of, an end of commanding, communion with him upon Mount Sinai, two tablets of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. We find once again in Exodus 34, 1, and the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee these two stones like unto the first, and I will write upon it these tablets, the words that were in the first tablets, which thou breakest. The third and perhaps most important ways that the Ten Commandments are unique in that they are in particular are called a covenant. We find that in Exodus 34, 28. This would be why they were among the items that were placed inside the Aharon Haberet, or the Ark of the Covenant. The source for this information is Torahbite.org, the Ten Words, Alan Gilman. Additionally, what we call the first commandment is not seen in Jewish tradition as a commandment at all, but rather a statement about God's identity and action. In fact, some authors state the covenant God established with Israel at Mount Sinai closely resembles ancient suzerain vassal treaties common in the Near East and ancient time, with the first commandment being in reality and utterance establishing a covenant. The preamble we find it in Exodus 22, where it says, I am the Lord your God. And also we find a historical a prologue in Exodus 22, which says, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Today's reading. The fifth word, the fifth word, Exodus 20, 12, says, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land which Yahweh your God gives you. This command to honor one's parent is among the first five words that have to do with man's relationship with Yahweh. Our relationship with our parents reflects our relationship with Yahweh. One who does not honor his parent does not honor Yahweh. One who honors his parents honors Yahweh. The first five words are summarizing the commandments, love Yahweh with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our might. We find this in Deuteronomy 6, 5, where it says, and thou shalt love the Lord your God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. We find this again in Matthew 22, 37 to 38, where Yeshua says unto him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. The five last words are summarizing the commandment to love one's neighbor as oneself. We find that in Leviticus 19, 18, where it says, thou shalt not avenge 
nor bear any grudge against the children of that people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. We find it also in Matthew 22, 39 to 40, where it says, and the second is like unto the first, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophet. This is the first commandment with promise. We see that in Ephesians 6, 2, where it says once again, honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Honoring one's parents gives a long life on earth. To honor means to respect with attitude, word, and deed. To honor also means to help them with material and practical needs, as it is written in Matthew 15, 3 to 6, where he says, he answered them, why do you also disobey the commandment of God? Because of your tradition. For God commanded, honor your father and mother. And he who he speaks evil of father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whosoever may tell his father and his mother, whatever help you might otherwise has gotten from me is a gift devoted to God. He shall not honor his mother or his father. You have made the command of God void because of your tradition. To honor does therefore also mean to give financial help. The Greek word that is translated tradition is Strong's 3862, paradosis, from the root word Strong's 3860, meaning to give up, to give order, or to deliver. Here it means a teaching that has been passed on or given up or delivered from a teacher to a disciple. In Galatians 1.14, we see, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Also, Colossians 2.8, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy, empty deceit, according to tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the word and not according to Christ. This is not a question of custom. Yeshua is attacking the false teachings that break the commandments of the Torah. Yeshua attacked these traditional teachings in certain cases. In other words, he's attacking oral tradition. In many more cases, however, he accepted them. A traditional teaching is not the same as a cultural tradition or a custom. Our Rabbi Yeshua did not criticize the Jewish cultural traditions and custom. By his own actions, we can see he followed them. Cultural tradition has to do with behavioral patterns and traditional teachings are interpretations of Torah that have been passed on from one teacher to pupil. Yeshua attached traditions of men, not cultural traditions of behavior patterns. The Greek word that is normally translated as custom is ethos. It is found in the following places. In the Masonic writings, it's found in Luke 1, 9, where it says, according to custom or ethos of the priesthood, his lot fell on him to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. That's concerning Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist. We find it also in Luke 2, 42. And when he, Yeshua, was 12 years old, they went to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. We find it also again in Luke 22, 39. Coming out, he, Yeshua, went to Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. Also in John 19, 40, then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices as the customs of the Jews was to bury. Also Acts 6, 14, and certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. We know that's not true. We find that also again in Acts 21, 21. But they had been informed about you that you teach all Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, not nor walk according to the customs. Of course, that person they're talking to is the Apostle Paul. We find it again in Acts 25, 16. And to them I answered, is it not the custom of the Romans to deliver a man to destruction before the accused meets the accuser face to face and his opportunity to answer for himself concerning the charge against him? That's again the Apostle Paul. We find it again in Acts 26, 3. Especially because you're an expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews, therefore I beg you to hear me patiently. That's the Apostle Paul or Shaul addressing King Agrippa. Hebrews 10, 25, 
and not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner, ethos, or custom of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more that you see that they are approaching. And finally, we see that Shelley Saul, or the apostle, did not break the customs of the fathers according to Acts 28 and 17, where it happened that after three days, Shaul called together those who were the leaders of the Jews. When they had come together, he said to them, I, brothers, though I had done nothing against the people in customs of our father, still was delivered to prison from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. Let's talk about the sixth word. The sixth word, Exodus 20, 13. It says, thou shalt not murder. This is not talking about carrying out a heavenly judgment on someone that has been condemned to death, but about murder. We say thou shalt not kill, but it says thou shalt not murder. The punishment for murder is execution. We find this in Leviticus 24, 17. Whoever kills any man shall surely be put to death. The seventh word, Exodus 20, 14. You shall not commit adultery. This is talking about being unfaithful to a marriage covenant by having sexual relations with the third person. Oh See Ezekiel 16, 32, where it says, but as a wife that committed adultery, which taketh strangers instead of her husband. With this act, the covenant is broken. The punishment for adultery is execution. See Leviticus 20, 10. The man who commits adultery with another man's wife commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress surely shall be put to death. Word eight, Exodus 20, 14, you shall not steal. This is interpreted as a prohibition against stealing a person. Since so Leviticus 19, 11 says, you shall not steal, nor deal falsely, nor lie to one another. There's another prohibition against theft in connection with material goods. The punishment for kidnapping its execution. See Exodus 21, 16. He who kidnaps a man and sells him, or if it's found in his hand, shall surely be put to death. So in America, what we call the African slave trade and in many other countries, what we're calling slavery is actually kidnapping. Let's go to the ninth word, Exodus 20, 16. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbors. This is mainly speaking about not giving false testimony about anyone in a court hearing. Have you read the news lately? Yeah. However, it also means that we should not say things about another and we should not lie. One of the most severe ways of giving false testimony is when one speaks in the name of Yahweh things that he has not said. The crime is punishable by death. Deuteronomy 18.20 but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. False testimony leads to the ruin of a society. It causes the innocent to be punished for things that they have not done. It is also causes theft, murder, and oppression to go unpunished. Anyone who gives a false testament brings ruin over the world, and in a smaller aspect, brings ruin over the nation. In Deuteronomy 19, 15 to 21, it is written, one witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin. In any sin that he sins, at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses should a matter be established. If an unrighteous witness rise up against any man to testify against him a wrongdoing, then both men between the controversy is shall stand before Yahweh, before the priests and before the judges who shall be in those days. And the judge shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness is a false witness and has testified false against his brother, then shall you do to him as he is thought to do to his brother. So shall you put away the evil from the midst of you. Those who remain shall hear and fear and shall henceforth commit no more such evil in the midst of you. Your eyes shall not pity. Life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. In Psalms 34, 11, 13, it is written, Come ye children, listen to me. I will teach you to fear of Yahweh, who is someone who desires life and loves many days, that he may see good. 
Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. There are six things which Yahweh hates. Yes, it's seven, which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are swift and running to mischief, a false witness who utter lies, and one who soars discord among the brothers. Mm -hmm. In Proverbs 12, 22, 19, 5, 9, 25, and 18, it is written, Lying lips are an abomination to Yahweh, but those who do the truth are his delight. A false witness shall not be unpunished. He who pours out lies shall not go free. A false witness shall not be unpunished. He who utters lies shall perish. A man who gives false testimony against his neighbor is like a club, a sword, or a sharp arrow. Gossip and slander among the things that wound the most and they have the ability to murder a person. As it is written in Leviticus 19, 16, you shall not go up and down as a slander among your people. You should not stand against the life of your neighbor. I am Yahweh. So we can see God hates the lying tongue and gossiping. In Proverbs 10, 18, it is written, he who has hatred has lying lips. He who utters slander is a fool. Mm -hmm. Revelation 21, 8 and 27, it is written. But for the cowardly, unbelieving, sinners, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their part is in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. There will in no way enter into anything profane or one who causes abomination or a lie but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Finally, the 10th word, Exodus 20, 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that it is in your neighbor's house. Coveting is wanting something that belongs to someone else. It is forbidden to do something that leads to having to belong, belong, what belongs to another when he wants to keep what he owns. It is forbidden to use pressure to convince anyone to sell something that he does not wish to sell, even if the full price is paid. Coveting that which belongs to others can lead to violence and murder. And we know in 1 Kings 21, Jezebel plots to kill Nabal and take his vineyard to give it to her husband, King Ahab. In conclusion, did you notice that every violation of words five through 10 concludes with the execution of the guilty party with the phrase, shall surely be put to death. Something to think about. The 10 words, words five through 10, Shabbat Shalom. I'm trying to figure out, do I need to even speak? Okay, because I'm here dumbfounded and I'm dumbfounded. Okay, we could take this lesson and I'm sitting here. You guys know I received uh, a, an award from Congressman Billy Rackus. I didn't share with you. I also received one from Senator Scott. Okay, also, I'm sitting here thinking I need to mail this lesson to both of them. Okay, for the Senate and the House. Okay, at this point. You look at this and I'm ready to crawl up underneath the table and just wait for the stars to fall and hit this, start hitting us at this point. You know, uh, um, and what is ironic, okay, what is so ironic is that when people say we need to turn this back to a Christian nation, people don't understand why I say, ah, oh, no, oh, no, leave it alone. Okay, because if you want to turn this into a Christian nation, then you're telling God he need to act according to his word based upon what it is you are doing. You understand? <laughs> okay, so y'all need to leave things just the way they are right now because should he act upon his word, we in trouble, folks. Okay, really, really. You guys are witnesses. I don't know whether just to tell you, go make sure you guys have 
either popcorn you put in a pan or microwave popcorn, pop it and sit back and just watch God, what he is about to do. Now, let me say something to you. These commandments also teach you how to pray. You understand? We aren't praying according to what the commandments say. And the reason, okay, we don't, is that we don't quite understand Deuteronomy 29, I think it is verse 28 or 29, depending upon whether you're in the Tanakh, okay, or the uh, King James Version, secret things, secret, secret, secret things belong to Yahweh our Elohim. But those things that are revealed belong to us to do according to the Torah. So when we see violations of these words, whose responsibility is it to act upon them? It's our responsibility. Now, if we don't act upon them according to the word of God, now let me say something. If you say you are a believer, then you have a responsibility to act according to your beliefs, right? So the question doesn't become if you are a believer, because I'll ask, who are you believing in? All right, it depends upon who you are believing in. All right, because if you believe in the creator of the heavens and the earth, the ones who gave these commandments, that's one thing. He's going to act one way. You anticipate him being faithful to his word. But if you really don't believe, okay, in him, then you can do whatever you feel like doing. You can make up rules as you go along. The danger is, is that God is going to have his way. He is going to have his way ultimately. All right. And that is why we are called as witnesses, guys. Why do you think he gave us these commandments, these words? I want to share my screen for just one moment here. All right. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Okay. Let me just uh, minimize that and minimize these. Okay. And what I did, uh, Ed quoted from Exodus chapter 34, verse 28, which says, and he was there with Yahweh 40 days and 40 nights. He, he did neither eat bread nor drink water. Does that sound familiar? 40 days, 40 nights, no eating bread or water. Where do we see that? We see that with Yeshua in the wilderness. Okay, remember, he, Yeshua is also a prophet like unto Moses. Okay. And he wrote upon the tables, the words of the covenant, the 10 commandments, okay? Just like Ed said, the word is not commandments. Commandments is mitzvah. If you hear, see here, you have here the words, hadabri, hadabri, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, uh, the words, asaret, hadevarim, hadevarim. That is the words, the words, 10 words. If we go down here and look, we see tables, the words of the covenant, that's the barit, the 10, aser, okay, and debar, okay, or devari, devarim, the 10 words. So we see it's 10 words, the 10 words. So when you hear them saying 10 words, okay, that's the way that it is written in Hebrew, but translated 10 commandments, okay, in the 10 commandments in the uh, um in the Bible, which is why we like to study, okay, the Hebrew also to see what God is actually saying in these scriptures. Let me, hold on, come out of this. I wanted to show that to you. All right. Now, I wanted to go back to a couple of them. The seventh word, the seventh word, okay, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not commit. A, these things scare me. Okay, I'm looking at this and they really scare me. The seventh and the eighth word. All right. If you remember seventh, eighth, and even ninth, if you were at the uh, service today, I kind of went over those in detail with the kids and especially that false testimony. The false testimony. If you give false testimony against someone, 
the punishment for that testimony that you wanted for that person comes back on you. You understand what I'm saying? All right. When you lie on someone, that the punishment for that lie is going to come back on you. Okay, it's so important to understand how these principles are. Just like it says here, false testimony leads to the ruin of society or as Ed also added, a nation. It causes the innocent to be punished for things they have not done. I'm not talking about somebody being punished, punished for things it's been proven they've done, but don't want to take responsibility or accountability for. So when you, once again, side with the guilty, then the punishment also comes upon you. Come on. The greatest example we have in the Bible is Lucifer. Lucifer convinced a third of the angels that he was above the throne of God. That his word was above the throne of God. Okay, so let me ask you something. What happened to Lucifer? You can unmute yourself. We can be interactive. What, ha what happened to Lucifer? He failed. Okay, he what failed. happened to those who followed him? They Cast out of the heaven of the presence right. of the most high. That's right. Where are they going to wind up? The lake of fire. So why are, is anyone, if it is on earth as it is in heaven, guess what God is giving us? He's giving us the pattern to look for on earth based upon what already happened in heaven. He gives us the Ten Commandments on earth because these are the things that are what? also in heaven, okay? <laughs> Having no other idols, putting no gods above, okay, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Committing adultery. Adultery is not only with, uh, you know, your spouse, but it can be with God because we're married to him, okay? Yeah. Also, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Which is why in the prophets, he compares Israel to an adulterous woman, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right? So we need to understand on earth as it is in heaven, so therefore, if you are judged or adjudicated, okay, on earth as guilty, you've already been adjudicated as guilty in the heavenly realm because it is on earth as it is, not shall be or might decide to become, but is in heaven. Mm -hmm. It comes a time, and this is why I'm saying, where in the world are the prophets? Where in the world are the prophets that should be looking, that want to want to force a brand of Christianity down the throats of Americans that is so far away, removed from the Christianity in the Bible? Because we don't want to hold accountable. Mm -hmm. You know, however, this is a sad thing. God is going to hold us accountable because we say we represent him the same way Israel was called to represent him to the nations. And when they failed to represent him from the nations, boop, here come Nebuchadnezzar, boop, here come Sennacherib, Sen boop, here come Titus. You understand what I'm saying? Boop, here it comes again. All right, here it comes again. All right, when are we going to learn? We don't learn. But guess what? I think you guys have. I think you guys get it. I think not only do you guys get it, but you're going to go out and spread, get it and spread it. <laughs> okay, get it and spread it. Okay, what's your name? My name is Butter. <laughs> okay, because <laughs> things about to get hot and I'm about to get spreading this word. Okay, as things get hot, the hotter it gets, the more spreadable I become. Okay, <laughs> we need to, we need to. Okay, so, you know, I was thinking also as um, we were talking about, so many people don't know who Paul is. You don't know who Paul is, what Paul calls himself. Where can, who can, I, I know all of you are Bible scholars, show me in the scripture where Paul calls himself a Christian. 
Come on now, I want to make sure. I want to make sure. Let's make sure. Ain't nobody lying here. All right, let me share my screen. I'm going to share my screen again. Let's look and see who Paul is. Not who Paul was, but who Paul is. Uh, hold on. I don't know why I can never get this on the first. All right, let me look here. All right, so wanted to talk about who Paul is. In the book of Philippians, this is a good one. Philippians 3.5. All right, uh, start at three, four. Though I might also have confidence in flesh, if any other man think it that, that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more than what does he do? Circumcised, he talks about who he is. Circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the Torah of Pharisee. So, what I did was, you know, click on the tools and I wanted cross references to those scriptures. And these are the different scriptures that came up for the different words you see highlighted here. But we are only going to deal with the ones that deal with Paul because we need to understand who Paul is. OK, so I'm going to go down to Acts chapter 22. How did Paul talk about himself? Acts number 22 I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the Torah of the fathers and was zealous towards Elohim as ye are, as ye all are this day. So with that, who is he talking to? He's talking to Jews. Okay, he's talking to them in the synagogue. Oh, wait a minute. But aren't there Gentiles who are believers in the synagogue also? And they are commanded to be in the synagogue where Moses is read. So it's always important to identify who, who is speaking, who they are, first of all, who they are speaking to, who the target audience is. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 11, 22. Let me click on this for a moment. All right. He says, okay, I speak, of, uh, I'll start at verse 21. I speak as concerning reproach as though we have been weak, howbeit wherensoever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I am more. Okay, he identifies himself as what? A Hebrew, as an Israelite, as the seed of Abraham. Let me go back. Okay, again. Romans 11, 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Let me see if there are... Um, any others? We already read that. Okay. Acts chapter 23, verse 6. But when Paul perceived, oh, wait a minute, let's go here. All right. You need to read Acts chapter 22 as well as Acts 23 to understand the context that this is in. All right. Paul right now is, uh, you know, uh, witnessing, giving his testimony. All right, let me see if I can hold on. Of course, this is a long chapter. All right, so he's before the Jews, okay, right now. And we read Acts chapter 22, verse 3, where he talks about who he is, how he was brought up and everything. He goes on to talk about, you know, uh, his testimony and the road to Damascus and everything. And uh, how he came about to be, once again, okay, who it is he is and why he is teaching, all right? And for his reward, what did he get? He got slapped in the face, <laughs> okay? So I don't know why you think everybody's going to run up to you and give you a hug, okay? Paul, we know he got really slapped in the face after he talked to them about that. Hold on, yeah. All right, and let's see here going down. 
All right, we see that he calls himself a Roman because they were about to tear him apart, but because he was a Roman is why he was rescued. Let's now let's go to the next chapter, 23. All right, now he's before the council. He's giving his testimony, all right? And this is where Ananias, the high priest, slaps him in the mouth. Paul calls him a name. And then they say, wait a minute, okay? He's the high priest. You can't revile him. What does Paul do? I didn't know he was high priest. For it is written, thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. What does Paul do? Why does he do that? He's showing them, hey, I'm apologizing because the Torah says a certain thing and I did wrong, okay, by, by his actions. Okay, but then here's one thing. But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, men and brethren, I am a Christian believer in Easter and Christmas and all of those. No, he says, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee of the hope and the resurrection of the dead. Why was Paul a perfect one to preach Yeshua? Because Yeshua was what? The proof of the resurrection of the dead. See, the Pharisees believed in the, that the dead would rise, but Yeshua was the first one, okay, that be giving the example of how God's promise was fulfilled through Yeshua, okay, with the resurrection of the dead. And he goes, and I am called in question. And when he said so, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Remember, you need to know who both of these groups are. Pharisees believed in angels, Sadducees didn't. Pharisees believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees didn't. Pharisees believed in the oral traditions. The Sadducees only in the written traditions. Whenever Yeshua was in a bind with both of them, he would immediately go over to one side, leave them fighting each other, and then go right through the crowd as they fought. Paul does exactly the same thing. So we see here, for the Sadducees say there is no resurrection. So would a Sadducee really believe in Yeshua had resurrected from the dead? Nah. No. Neither angel nor spirit, but fat, the Pharisees confess both. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. All right. So it's important to understand who's who, because who's who in a lot of cases is the reason why they believe the way that they did. It goes on, verse nine, there arose a great cry and the scribes that were the Pharisees part rose and strove saying, we find no evil in this man. But if a spirit or an angel have spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Okay. And so the captain takes him away because they're about to, you know, go ham on him and everything uh, with that. So that is who Paul is. He identifies with his brother and he lets you know exactly who he is. Why is that important? It's important because who he is is going to determine how he teaches. You understand? He gives you the reason who he is and why he believes, okay, in Yeshua and why he can believe in Yeshua as a Pharisee because the Pharisees believe in the resurrection of the dead. So it's just a point to tell you who he is. Now, let's go. Wait a minute. I should have stopped. I'm going to share again. Hold on here. I got so much up. Give me a moment. Oh, sorry. I messed that up. Didn't mean to do that. All right. I think I have. Yes, it's this. Ah, okay. All right. I was, what was I looking? Okay. Looking up the word Christian. All right. So. You have the word Christian. You want to look it up in the Bible. 
All right. And so this is why the blueletterbible.org is a valuable tool. So I put in the word Christian to see how many times it comes up in the Bible, in particular King James Version. Acts 26, 28, Paul is before Agrippa. At the end, verse 28, then Agrippa said unto Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. All right. Second time, First Peter. So we have Paul here. We have First Peter 4, 16. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Now, let's click on the word Christian. Christianos, which is a proper noun. Okay, let's go. It's uh, Strong's number G5546. Proper noun, used a total of three times, a Christian, a follower of Christ. So what is the meaning? We have here Strong's G5546. The name was first given to the worshipers of Yeshua by the Gentiles, by the Gentiles, because the Jews were simply considered another sect of Judaism of the believers of Yeshua. They were the sect of the Nazarenes. Okay, S-E-C-T, let me see if that's how they, okay. Uh, let me go, okay, here we go. Acts 24, verse five. But we have found this man a pestilent fellow, a moreover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world, a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. So we have the sect of the Pharisees, the sect of the okay, Sadducees, a sect of the Nazarenes. Each one, okay, represented a certain belief system. The Pharisees, we went over. We went over the Sadducees, over what they didn't believe. The Nazarenes, okay, based upon what they believed, were more like the, okay, I'll say, uh, of the Pharisees, okay, because Paul was a Pharisee. Yeshua was more, okay, of a Pharisee, believing in resurrection angels and all of that. And so the original believers were called a sect of the Nazarenes, a sect of the Nazarenes. It was the Gentiles that called what Gentiles coming into the faith Christian. Okay, Christian. So important to understand that. You can look that up yourself. Now, we started talking about uh, the scriptures in 1 Timothy and Titus giving. Hold on, let me come back out here. Stop, share. Okay, talking about um, the first century church. All right, you received, okay, in your uh, email, all right, an article called the first century church, the first century church. So I'm gonna read part of that. You know, I might go ahead and uh, share the screen for those that are on Facebook. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Here we go. Let me make this a little bit larger so that it can be seen. Oh, that's a little bit too large. Hold on here. Okay. Pull you up here. Hold on a minute. I'm still trying to get my screens together here. Okay. So let me come down. Okay, first century church. So it's important in view of the scriptures that we uh, that we read also, because uh, Ed was teaching us, okay, about the customs and traditions also. One note on that, Ed, that you could put on that from your reading about the customs and traditions. Where was that in particular? I think I highlighted it in particular, what you were talking about. Let me see here. Okay, because that comes becomes very important when you consider, okay, it was after the 
in the fifth word where he says cultural tradition tradition has to do with behavioral patterns and traditional teachings or interpretations of the Torah. Let me come up here so that you see where I'm reading. Okay, right here. Cultural tradition has to do with behavioral patterns and traditional teachings are interpretation of the Torah that have passed on from teacher to pupil. Why is this important to understand? Because if you consider what was going on in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, remember Corinthians is the book that was written in response to a church, a woman pastor church, Chloe, okay, who had asked certain questions. If you go and turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, okay, the title of that is basically God's ordained order. And this is where we have this whole controversy uh, a lot of times on head coverings, whether a woman should cover her head or, or not cover her head. All right, so with traditions and what we say here, People seem to forget what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 16, all right? But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. So if your, your custom, as long as your custom does not take you away from the Torah, you can follow them. What he is saying is that if this is your tradition, fine, it's your tradition. However, it isn't a tradition of the church of God. Don't get twisted about it because it is just one of your traditions. And that's fine. Traditions that do not come against the Torah are one thing. But when you take your tradition and put it above the Torah and try to condemn people because they don't want to go with your tradition, that is not right. Okay, that is not necessarily right. And that becomes the traditions of man versus the word of God. So it is not a God ordained commandment that a woman wear a head covering. That was a tradition in that particular society that is at that point. Now, if your ministry does that, there's nothing wrong with it. You wanna stay in that ministry, then you do that. If you cannot agree with that, don't be contentious about it. Maybe that ministry is not for you then, okay? Because you don't work in Burger King wearing a McDonald's uniform, all right? You're wearing a McDonald's uniform, so don't get certain things twisted. Now, first century church again. In the first century church, women were not segregated from men. Now, uh, um, Ed, I remember you saying something, okay, about um, you going to a particular going to a particular ministry, and uh, everybody was separated. Okay, they separated the men from the women, and all of that. And once again, that is a tradition of man, tradition of men, because in the days of Yeshua, the first century, the synagogue, women were not se uh, separate, segregated. Contrary to popular myth, women were not segregated in the first century worship services, either the church or synagogues. If you worshiped in a synagogue, you would find entire families worshiping together. Not like today when you walk in the church and the first thing they do is tear your children away from you. Okay, children over here. Okay, family over here. Children getting one teaching, family, the mother and father getting another teaching. Or even further, they tear the children away, then they tear the husband and wife away from each other. Go figure. Anyway, the only specialized seating was by trade. Stonemasons would sit together. Carpenters would sit together, but otherwise there was no segregation of any kind. The older sat on the higher benches and the younger on the lower benches, but there was no class or sex segregation. Synagogues worshiped exactly like ancient churches 
and modern churches and united family groups of mother, father, and children. Okay? Number two, imperial decree for the synagogue of Halicarnassus in 30 BC. All right? The decree of those, those of Halicarnassus when Memnon, the son of Aristides, by descent, but by adoption of Unisimus, was priest on the day of the month Aristerium, the decree of the people upon the representation of Marcus Alexander was this. Since we have ever a great regard of, to piety towards God and to holiness, since we aim to follow the people of the Romans who are the benefactors of all men, of what they have written to us about a league of friendship and mutual assistance between the Jews and our city, that their sacred offices and accustomed festivals and assemblies may be observed by them. We have decreed that as many men and women of the Jews as are willing to do so may celebrate their Sabbaths and perform their holy offices according to the Jewish laws and may make their proshuke or synagogue at the seaside according to the customs of their forefathers. And if anyone, whether he be a magistrate or private citizen, hindereth them from do so, he shall be liable to a fine to be applied to the uses of the city. That's written in, okay, Josephus, okay, his book of the antiquities. So we see in culture, okay, what we see here in culture. Notice that from the pagan Roman point of view, both men and women worship equally in the synagogue without segregation. All of this is written, okay, in history, guys. All the literary evidence is silent on segregation. That women worship together with the men seem to be the only conclusion that can be drawn from the inscriptions and the archeological and literary evidence. In any case, the contrary opinion that women worshiped in a gallery or in a separate section of the hall has not been proven. And these ancient synagogues, archeology span and art. Okay, so we are seeing, hold on. My computer just decided that it wanted to uh, lose a little bit of power here. Um, all right, I'm getting it together, guys. All right, there we go. All right, so we see once again, archeological evidence, men and women worship together. In addition, any indications of a separation between men and women were also absent from early synagogues. None of the ones described or other potentially pre-70 buildings had a gallery that might be or high or held to be a woman's gallery. If there were to be a division between men and women, it would have been had to be by means of a barrier in the middle of the benches. Yet the space itself with all participants looking at each other from benches around the walls was designed to highlight the communal, almost democratic character of the space. It is unlikely that the builders would have created a space that expressed the community's oneness and then have subdivided it in such a way as to call that sense of oneness into question. So we see hmm. that in another book. C, women in the synagogue. Women frequently attended the synagogue and were present during worship. Hello, do we remember the woman that was bent over? Okay, that went to the synagogue, okay, and was healed by Yeshua, woman thou art loose. Okay, according to the rabbinic traditions and various literary sources from the second century, their presence in the synagogue was acknowledged and accepted with no distinctions and seating for males and females. That's another archeological evidence, okay? The Therapeutae were a Jewish monastic order in Egypt of self-denial and devotion to God that later Christians used as a pattern for Christian monastic orders. So here's where we get the priesthood, Catholic priesthood, the Therapeutae, okay? They did, practice, they did practice segregation, but this was exceptional. And it was also a monastic order and not a synagogue. So maybe some of the separation became evident with the Catholic Church, not the original synagogues. 
Philo describes them in 50 AD. Therefore, during six days, each of these individuals retiring into solitude by himself, philosophizes by himself in one of the places called monasteries. Okay, Mon yeah, monasteries. Never going outside the threshold of the outer court and indeed never even looking out. But on the seventh day, they all come together as to meet in a sacred assembly. They sit down in order according to their ages with all becoming gravity, keeping their hands inside their garments, having their right hand between their chest and their dress and the left hand down by their side close to their flank. Then the eldest of them who was the most profound learning in their doctrines come forward and speaks with steadfast look and with steadfast voice, with great powers of reasoning, great prudence, not making an exhibition of his oratorical powers like the rhetoricians of old or sophists of the present day, but investigating with great pains and explaining with minute accuracy the precise meaning of the laws which sits not indeed at the tips of their ears, but penetrates through their hearing unto the soul, remains there lastingly, and with all the rest listening in silence to the praises which he bestows upon the law, showing their assent only by nods of the head and eager looks of the eyes. And this holy place, Greek, Semenion, to which they all come together on the seventh day is a twofold circuit, being separated partly into the apartment of men and partly into the chamber for the women. For women also, in accordance to the usual fashion there, form a part of the audience having the same feelings of admiration as the men and having adopted the same sect with equal deliberation and decision. And the wall which is between the houses rises from the ground three or four cubits upward like a battlement and the upper portion rises upwards toward the roof without any opening on first two accounts. First of all, in order that the <clears throat> modesty which is so becoming to the female sex may be preserved and secondly, that the women may be easily able to comprehend what is being said, seated within earshot, since there is nothing which can possibly intercept the voice of him who is speaking. This is regarding to, once again, the Gentile churches, which now you can understand why Paul is talking about women being silent. Look at the way that after the church began to leave its Jewish okay, traditions of the synagogue and start forming these various houses based upon what we see here would be Paul coming in and bringing order. They were Gentiles. They were pagans who come into the faith, okay, and brought certain things that were not the traditions of the original church. All right, now, this is what Rabbi Joshua, the question was, what do women do by way of leadership in Messianic Judaism today? During the second temple period in ancient Israel, women were able to actively participate within the larger society, both society, socially and religiously. Women served as leaders of synagogues. Remember, we have Phoebe who was given the letter to the Romans. We have Chloe, okay, also had her own church house. They participated in ritual services, learned and taught Jewish laws. Now, not the priesthood. Remember, the priesthood is still the priesthood. Women under the church did not all of a sudden jump up in the, uh, uh, in the temple. There's difference between synagogue and temple, guys. Remember that. The synagogue is not a temple, okay, according to the temple that we learn, okay, in the Torah. Now, learned and taught in Jewish law, were counted in a minion and from archaeological evidence do not seem to have been physically separated from men during prayer. There was active participation of women in all facets of Jewish life. According to Shmuel Safre, in the second temple period, women were religiously the equals of men. Well, that makes sense considering in the book, in the garden, Adam and Eve were equals. Ancient Jewish sources from the land of Israel and from the diaspora show that women frequented the synagogues and studied in the Bet Midrash, which is study hall. 
Women could be members of the Quorum of Ten needed to save the 18 benedictions and like Simona is right, and like men, women were permitted to say amen in response to the priestly blessing. Archaeological evidence supports that women were not necessarily separated from the men in the synagogue. This is the result of no apparent evidence from any of the numerous synagogues that have been excavated that would seem to indicate men and women were required to sit separately. This scholarly assumption is supported by Sapre, who comments, rabbinic sources mentions various functions for synagogue balconies and upper rooms, but there is never a connection made between these structures and women. The first representation to a miklisa is connected to Abaye, 4th century CE, 400s, 400s, which is over 360 years, okay, about 360 years after the death and ascension of Christ. So the church has been going on for 300 years by this time. In the Babylonian Talmud, Kiddushin 81a, in many opinions, it is unrelated to the synagogue as a result of recent scholarly insight into this arena, any kind of inference of women's inferiority based on supposed separation doing prayer is not supported by archeological or textual evidence. Inscriptions discovered in ancient synagogues from the early centuries also testified to women having served in various leadership capacities throughout the Jewish world. These inscriptions include heads of synagogues, hello, heads of synagogues, leaders, elders, and other parallels. These inscriptions in feminine conjugations bear witness to the very public roles of women, thus further proving that women were indeed active members within their spiritual communities, okay? So for all those who say women can't, women can't, women can't, stop it, okay? Because that is not something that is proven in history. Remember what I always say, all right? This is a mouse, funny looking mouse, to a computer. If I turn this over, it should still be a mouse. It doesn't turn into a tiger. <laughs> okay? It is what it is. So if it didn't begin a certain way, all right, it shouldn't wind up ending a certain way. If you have a tradition, then that is your tradition. But don't be saying that this is the way the church was founded because that proves you a liar or proves you that you do not know your history of the church. The Bible says to study, to show yourself approved unto God that you can rightly divide the word of truth. And that means why we need to study scripturally, we need to study culturally, we need to study historically, which is exactly what we did today. We broke down the formation of the church based upon what the scriptures say, okay? What the culture says and what historical says. So anyone get out your mind when you, some people say that this is the way it's supposed to be, that you are out of order. You need to start showing. This is why I give you these articles, guys, so that you can show them and tell them, why don't you look up this evidence, okay, instead of some of the other things you do. A lot of the things that people do is because of their traditions and also because of what is in their heart. You understand what I'm saying, all right? We see that the Bible says a husband should have only one wife, but I want two or more. Okay, that's not scriptural. Okay, that's not, that's something you want. You understand what I'm saying? 
Don't pick and choose, okay? The Bible is not a supermarket where you can choose what is on aisle A and what is on aisle C, but you don't have to take what's on aisle B. No, it doesn't work that way. And when you get into organizations that do that, there are times where you'll say, why did God send me here? The reason he sent you there is because you are a witness. God always will send a witness into some place when he is about to deal with that place in a certain way. So you need to understand if you are feeling called into a place, let me say this to you, okay? You feel called into a place. Paul went into the synagogues on the Sabbath day where Moses was read. He took out Gentiles. He taught both Jews and Gentiles. But there came a point where his words and his teaching were rejected. Paul didn't go back there anymore. He went on to the Gentiles, which goes back to what we taught on Thursday evening about Isaiah chapter 6. How long are you going to teach this, Isaiah? Until the land is desolate? 90% of those on the land are going to be lost. But there will be a remnant that survives, okay, that. All right, that kind of destruction. Paul, you'll see in the book of Acts says, I'm through with going to the Jews. I am now going to the Gentiles, which is the fulfillment of the book of Isaiah, where God says, I will be sent to a people that is not a people to bring them to me. You understand what I'm saying with that? So there is a, an appointed time and an appointment for you to go to a particular people, but based upon their response is how God will deal with them. Those that do the right thing, okay, he will bless. Those that don't, they won't. You will have a tendency to see when you go into an organization, it will fit exactly what we see here. There will be those that say, yes, 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 let's do it. There will be those that rise up against it. You understand? Okay, now here's the rub. Those that said, yes, 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 in the Bible did what? Got up and left those who said, uh, uh, uh. They didn't stay up on in them. That's why you have a house of Chloe. That's why you have a Paul sending a Timothy. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, so now you know what to look for. And then when they leave, God deals with them. God dealt with the Jews. Hey, come on. 40 years later, here come Titus. Next thing you know, you don't have no synagogue to go to because they all burnt down and you're in exile. Okay, at that point, there comes a time when God will test. He will send an, a witness in to see if what he's seeing is so. Out of the mouth of two or three, when, I'm always careful when he send me with someone else because I know what that principle is. Out of the mouth of, he sent two angels into Sodom. He don't, he sent the disciples two by two. You understand why? Because out of, what is the commandment? Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Judgment comes out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. That's just the way it is, guys. I don't write it. I don't write it. We just Read it the way it is. So just beware and be aware. There comes an appointed time for your assignment. There comes an appointed place for your assignment. There comes an appointed time for you to do that assignment. And then based upon the response is whether you continue or whether you kick. What did Paul do? I'm kicking the dust off of my feet and I am out of here to go to those who are hungering and thirsting for the truth. That's just the way you do it, guys. You understand what I'm saying? When you follow that pattern, you will be very effective. You will be very effective. 
On Thursday, we talked about God got to the point where he told the prophet, look, don't even pray for them. I'm not going to hear you. Tell them if they pray, I'm not going to hear them. You understand what I'm saying? There comes a time of a point of no return. Okay. So when God sends you and you feel that unction to go into a place, understand something. God's getting ready to deal with that place and those people in a certain way. All right. That's why it's important for you to understand how everything was set up to begin with, because you will be sent places where they will reject you because of your gender. They will not hear you because of your gender. They may not hear you because of your color. Okay. But if God sent you there, he's about to deal with them based upon the very things that we just discussed, which are contrary to what the word says. You understand? God called Adam and Eve, all right? He called Adam and Eve as ministers together. Why is there so much sexual immorality in the church? We're so worried about the sexual immorality in the, in the world. We are so against two males in the world. Well, God called to minister Adam and Eve not just Adam and Steve in the ministry. Come on, too many same-sex, okay, alliances in the ministry on earth as it is in heaven. It is simply a reflection, and then you're all surprised when you see the sexual immorality between those in the pulpit. Stop it! Where in the world are the prophets? That's what I want to know. Where in the world are the prophets to come and set things straight? Okay, Prophet Ed. <laughs> okay, I'm done. Okay, bring us out. Heavenly Father, God of Abraham, God of Isaac and Jacob, our Lord, God of our fathers, God rule over heaven and earth. We thank you, Father, that we've been obedient to your word today. We thank you, Lord, for those who went in the mission field earlier today, Lord, to visit those young men in prison. We thank you that souls are saved behind those prison walls, that lives are changed. Thank you for this word today, Father. It was not our word, but it was your word, your commandments, Father. We thank you that you spoke them to Moshe thousands of years ago. Lord, we are still here, and we thank you that we're here because we're obedient to your word. We thank you that you have long life. Children who honor their mother and father will have long life. We thank you for more honor. Thank you for less lying. We thank you that people not to lie and not to slander against each other. Father, we just thank you for the word we received today. We thank you for instruction on how to live. We pray for all those that might need healing, Father God, any of those who might be in financial despair, Father God. We pray for any, Lord, homes that are being divided. We pray for the children, Lord, in all situations. We pray for the children in Gaza, Father. We pray for the whole house of Israel, Father, that those captives can be freed, Father, that the war can come to an end. Thank you, Lord. We pray also for Ukraine, the war in Ukraine. And we pray, Lord, for America, Father. We pray that repentance come into this nation and the spirit of mercy comes into this nation, that a spirit of truth rise up. Thank you for the word we received today. Thank you for the lesson. Thank you for the pastor for blessing this word. We thank you in Yeshua's name. We pray. Amen and amen. 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 <laughs> amen. Okay, give us a nugget. Uh, first nugget I got is commandments are instructions for a formerly enslaved people to live as a free people in the promised land. And that other point was the Bible is a GPS. The end point is Yeshua. And lastly, if God values you, you are valued. Those are my points. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor, All for right, your word and breaking it down as you do. <laughs> Um, I just want my name to be Butter. <laughs> <laughs> so I can spread the word. <laughs> Thank you. And then something that you said on the, toward the end. I've always heard him always talk about Eve and Steve. But what about, I mean, about uh, Adam and Steve? What about Eve and Barbara? <laughs> oh, okay, hey, same thing. <laughs> you know, but they stay on that, the, the, the Eve and Steve, but I'm, you know, it's really nothing too much about that that I've read. You know, so why is it always Eve and Steve and not the other? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm just thinking about that. Thank you, Pastor. 
You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. Uh, Joshua, Rabbi Joshua, Joshua Broombach. Okay, is the name. You can look them up yourself if you want. All right. Uh, um, let's see here. Hermine. <clears throat> Wow, I was writing <clears throat> writing away like crazy. <laughs> there was a lot in there, but um, <clears throat> essentially, if we know the truth, we follow the word, you know, we follow the, the uh, what we've been doing, which is uh, learning the, the word uh, scripturally, culturally. Um, what's the other one I forget? Historically. Uh, Sorry? Historically. Historically, yes. Um, boy, it's so, it, it rounds it out, makes it clear. And I so appreciate it because there's so much that isn't truth and that is thrown at people and people just accept it. Mm -hmm. And so I am very grateful for this walk that he has brought me i mean <clears throat> i can't tell you i mean it's i've gone through through a, um brought up in the as a pentecostal <clears throat> my mother <clears throat> through marriage went into the catholic church <laughs> i mean you name it i've been there done that <laughs> as far <laughs> as seeking the lord and you know I'm, i never separated from that part of it but but listening to men versus really, really digging into the word. And this is, this is what uh, I am so grateful for because we are digging into the word. We are digging into the truth. And I have to thank you, Pastor, for um, the way you relate you know, or relate this to us because it's so clear, so understandable. So, I mean, there's no getting around it, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I have to say, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I thank the Father for his direction. Now, you know, all of that was necessary for me to get to this point, <laughs> you know, all of that previous history, um, so that I have a background to say, Yay and amen. This is the truth. <laughs> you know? I've seen all the lies, you know. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. praise God. And thank you, Pastor. This was wonderful. I, I really, this is <laughs> this is amazing. Um, I mean, I know people who are are stuck in that separation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the churches, and it's sad, mm -hmm. you know. But yeah, it's liberating to see this and to see the truth for sure. Amen. Amen. Now, when I bring you an article, okay, remember what I said, this is a mouse, right? Right. If I turn it upside down, it's still a mouse. Right. We had two articles, one of them based upon ancient history going back to 70 AD. The last one was a modern Okay, uh, a, a rabbi. He's a, a rabbi, a messianic rabbi. Um, UMJC. One of them. One of them acronyms. Okay, of the messianic movements. Also, because once again, if this is a mouse, then what you should be saying is the same thing they were saying years ago. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. So we get a lot of things. I don't. I don't give you something because just so and so said it. The reason I give it to you is because it's been evidenced through something that is in evidence, the archaeological, all of through history, yeah. all of that. You understand right. what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah. That. It's backed up. Sure. Sometimes I give sources. Sometimes I don't because people will sometimes look at his source. Well, I don't agree with, I don't agree with a hundred percent. In fact, I don't agree with a lot that UMJC says, but <laughs> Truth is true. If yes. what he said is verified by a document coming from 70 AD or 30 AD or what the Bible says, then there's no problem. If it isn't, then that could be a problem. 
That is yeah. why I don't just go on just because so-and-so says that they are a rabbi or just because so-and-so says this. Remember, even Yeshua didn't do that, okay? Even he didn't. So that is why we do various sources. And when I give you a source, sometimes I'll look and see if you'll come back to me and say, hmm, I don't quite agree with such and such. Bang, that's what I wanted to hear from you. You understand that if I'm teaching you the right thing, you're going to come back to me and say certain things. At that point, I don't have to worry about you going elsewhere. You understand what I'm saying? I never worry about you going elsewhere because if you know the truth, when you hear something that isn't the truth, it's going to mess with you and you'll come back and then we can go over it. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. Amen. Okay, so that's how that's how you do. That's why I don't care you go into a whole bunch of different sources. What I do care about is if you look at that source and a lot of things say that that source is the gospel truth. No, I want you to look up in the word. I want you to look it up historically. I want you to look it up culturally. Okay, because it should all say the same thing. And when it does, guess what? Your confidence in the word goes up. Yes. Okay. Yes. Your confidence will be perceived as arrogance sometimes. No, I'm not arrogant. I'm confident in what God says to me. I know the creator of the heavens. And first of all, I know he will show me the truth if I want it. It's how I react to it that makes a difference. Yes. I may not like what God is showing me. Okay. But it is him showing it to me. Yes. You understand what I'm saying? And this is how I learned to test everything. Because when we were in the church, we ate up everything just like, mm -hmm. oh, that's good. We ran around the aisles. We did all of that. That was so good. <laughs> then we come into Torah and find out we were eating them pork chops. We were eating <laughs> bread. But you're a Pentecostal. All right. And it yes. may have been good in creation, but God said it was an abomination of yes. your body. So yeah. from that point on, when I saw that, we test everything. Understand? Amen. We test it. Okay. And when it comes up, still looking the same, we're okay to go. And Amen. that's how you do it. Marcia Frith, we haven't seen you for a long time. Shabbat shalom, guys. <laughs> Are you cool. thought out? Have you thought out yet? I know. I was in Chicago last week. Ooh. Oh, my God. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah i thought out thank god i'm back in florida um but uh, yeah i wanted to say brother ed you taught a um an awesome message um brother ed so i know he was talking about the commandments so and it's funny you know pastor you um followed up by saying you know if our country really wants to be a christian nation I don't even know if they understand because I think people would be dropping dead if they really want to follow the mm -hmm. true instructions of a Christian nation. Um, and Ed, you did a great job in just breaking that down. So that was very revealing. Um, and also Pastor too, just talking about, and I know Hermine had said that as well, like the history, just understanding history, you kind of understand where you currently are. And I always believe doing research and going back and reviewing things and just not taking things as face value. And even so with history, that's why I don't understand like we have in schools today where they want to take away history and they mm. want to change history and you cannot do that. There's no way. And, you know, thank God for things that are open now that people can research and look into things. I know that they talk about, you know, social media being, you know, a detriment. And yeah, there is always, you know, good and bad to something. But now, like, since we have social media, things are being exposed and people get to do more research and understand things and understand their history. So uh, thank you, Pastor, because I always think when you do teach, you do give uh, historical um, evidence. And it's for us, you know, as believers to go back and research and read and get an understanding because that's how we're going to explain it. That's how we're going to minister to other people. Nowadays, people want like, show me, let me see. I want to understand. So it's good for us to really kind of, um, it, not kind of, it's good for us to really do uh, our research and understand the history of certain things. And when we're coming to people with the word. Um, so, you know, thank you for that pastor um, for just giving us a 
providing us revelation and history on that. So miss you guys. Love you. And I know pastor, you're leaving soon. We're going to miss you, but I got to come and see you. I promise when I say I promise, I'm going to do something. So I'm going to see you before 13th. So yes. All right. All right. Guys, Excellent. Yeah, Excellent. You said something, uh, um, very profound also one of our commandments when we talk about being a a christian nation and especially with uh um when you look at slavery okay and all of that um one of the first things one of the first things that they did with those that they enslaved was to convert them to christianity mm. okay that's right right? And we're a Christian nation, right? Mm. You convert someone to Christianity. When you convert them to Christianity, what do they become to you? Less. <laughs> a brother. Mm -hmm. We call them brethren, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, <That's>... so <laughs> is the Torah very clear about if this person is a Hebrew like you, or a brother like you, you treat them in a certain manner. One of the biggest dangers that this country did because of the ignorance of our arrogance was to convert people to Christianity and then brutalize them yes. in a way that was inconsistent with the word of God. Because we very clearly see here he says, you kidnap a man, whether it's sold to him or you're caught holding them, you shall be put to death. What about a whole nation whose foundation was built upon this very commandment? Come on. What about those who wrote this foundation of the Constitution who were slaveholders? Oh, everybody's silent. What about those who wrote the Constitution, like a Thomas Jefferson, who were known to sexually abuse his slaves? Mm. He was a married man, right? Yes. That means he was committing what? Adultery. Adultery. Uh-oh, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> getting you folk woke. <laughs> so, um... Marcia, this is why? good. This is good. Black history teaching. Okay. Why do they want so to I erase? Amen. Why do they want to erase history, Marcia? Because if you have history, you have something to judge today based upon things that happened yesterday. Okay. Those who want to erase your history, not forget it. If you forget history, you will tend to repeat it. People who want to erase your history want to erase it because they intend on repeating it. Mm -hmm. hmm. Better mm. think about it. Mm -hmm. okay, better think about it. Think about things that are going on. Certain laws today are not about what they're telling you. It's all about rights. I'm taking away your, oh, let's go backwards. If we look at history, let's go backwards when rights were not given to blacks or women. Come on. Oh, we're the world of prophets. I need to find out where all these prophets in these churches are. Your prophet. Okay. Because the people of God are not getting the right message. So therefore, we can't pray the way that we're supposed to. Oh, God, let's all get together and bless this mess. Come on. So these Ten Commandments are the foundation for a legal system that is on earth, meant to be on earth as it is in heaven. So how does Pastor Israel pray? I stand before you, God the judge of all the earth, the judge of all the earth, and shall not the judge of all the earth do according to his word. Lord, these are the charges that have been brought. 
Father, you are the one true God. Heaven and earth, I call you to take the stand as witnesses and to testify as to the validity of whether these charges are true or false. And God, because you are the judge of all the earth, shall you not do according to your word. Hmm. Now, why can I pray that also? Oh, that's so mean. No, Yahweh Elohim. Elohim is judgment. Yahweh is mercy. Hmm. I always know God will judge according to his mercy. But he also says that that does not clear the guilty visiting the iniquity upon the guilty. You understand what I'm saying? So if God renders judgment, okay, for guilt, and there is no repentance and turning around for the crime, he is doing right and he is doing righteous. I, let me ask you something. Genesis chapter 19, Sodom and Gomorrah. He destroys the city, right? Genesis 20 don't begin with Abraham saying, God, I thought, why did you destroy the city and all that kind of stuff after your word? No. You don't see Moses praying for the guilty. He prays for the innocent. Are all of them going to be destroyed just because of this? God says, don't worry about that. Okay? No, I will not destroy them all. But those who did the deed will be Okay, judge. And when you are righteous judgment, when you pray for righteous judgment, he will protect the innocent and only the guilty according to his word. You lie about someone else, the penalty for that lie is going to come on you. You commit this, the penalty of that is going to come on you. Stop mm -hmm. trying to put people above the word of God and allow God to render his justice and judgment so that this country can be blessed. Well, I got something for you Thursday that might blow your mind the thought. I don't want to offend anybody right now. Okay, but something that he showed me today about it, about certain policies and everything. So as a matter of fact, I'll probably wait until we get off of uh, Facebook because I don't want to be put in jail. But <laughs> anyway, I want Hebrew Institute to be put in Facebook jail. So we'll address this another time. Anyway, back to nuggets again. All right, let's do Sher uh, Sherry uh, next nugget. Okay, uh, lawyer Marcia. Okay, did I, did I cover that? Okay, lawyer Marcia. Yes, you did a great disclaimer, Pastor. <laughs> <Very good. laughs> Go ahead, uh, Sherry. Oh, shalom, everyone. Shalom. Uh, so, uh, her mate. Hermine's uh, reading where she did Romans 2, 25. I think she started in 25. Yeah. Um, that um, was interesting because it talked yeah. about like, uh, like if you broke the Torah, you like reverse circumcision. So I have to look at that more. I have to go back and look at that. And I never heard of that before. Um, The... Um, the reading that I did, um, first Timothy 3, 11, where you said that women was, um, substituted for wives. And it makes so much sense because they're talking about husbands, 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 and you're going to now reverse it and then talk about wives, you know, next to it. And then they just put women, you know, like all women, you know, um, it didn't, uh, it makes so much sense. Thank you for your research and mm -hmm. letting teach us about that. I think that, and that, that there was no early separation um, in, in the um, early synagogues and stuff that came later. That is, um, you know, I think they probably didn't want to deal with children, <laughs> I think. The women take care of the children, and then they just wanted to like, you know, separate like women and children, <laughs> the men. So I don't know. <laughs> Thank you for your research. Thank you for the word. And Shabbat Shalom. All right. To explain that scripture to you about the circumcision and uncircumcision.
Uh -huh. Circumcision is a sign of a covenant. So when you see circumcision, those who are in covenant, when you break the Torah, you are breaking the covenant. Mm -hmm. so it is as if uncircumcision. Uncircumcision is outside of covenant. When you sin, you are acting outside of covenant. So it's just the way that Paul uses to describe being in sin. Circumcision, those who are in covenant, whether it is circumcision of the flesh, circumcision of the heart. When you sin, you are acting outside of the covenant, like one who is uncircumcised. So when you sin, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. Then when you repent, boy, that's like okay. restoring to the covenant again. That's mm -hmm. all that that is an analogy about. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. you. All right. Did you have a question on that too? Did you wonder about that too, Connie? Yes. Yes. Thank you for breaking that down. Okay. That's why I say you break things down so plainly. It's like, it's amazing. I'll be like, who is she? You know? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Oh, God. I'll tell you that. <laughs> All right, Detroit. Wow, just get her to walk away and get my rubber thumb. <laughs> uh, I have these pages to turn, so it's easier for me that way. But uh, this is just awesome, awesome through the roof. And I've been listening for years, and the most high just keep taking you higher and deeper. Now, how can you do both? But the, the, well, the nugget that I was uh, going to bring up is that you said when you ask people, are you a believer? And they say, yes, we need to follow up with the question, who do you believe in? Because often people believe in a different uh, God than we do. We believe in the God of creation of heaven and earth. But people have made gods out of other things. So it's important to understand that. Also, you talked about the adultery, the adultery, not only against your spouse, but against the most high. Mm -hmm. Because we are his bride and we are married to him. And when we sin against him and we turn and serve other gods, we're committing adultery. Mm -hmm you know, against our, our Lord and Savior. Traditions in the early church. You certainly explained that so well, and I, I'm going to read it again about the covering of the head and separation of seating during worship. And you, you added a coda. You say people do things based on their traditions and what's in their heart, then they want others to follow suit. But we must search the word of God. Thank you for that. And the last thing, uh, <laughs> and you're so right, the church is full of immorality and same sex or whatever they do, but yet they want to go out and point a finger at those in the world. The Most High said, charity began at home, I think. So that was something that kind of stuck with me. And I pray that that changes because they leaders will be held accountable and exposed, I believe, uh, particularly in 2024. Thank you. Bless my brothers and sisters. Shalom to all of you. I love you. Shalom, shalom. Now, let, let me tell you how powerful this screen is right here. Why stay on my P's and Q's? Okay, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. That's the way it is, two or three witnesses. Marcia often knew me before I got saved up in New York. We worked together up in New York in the 1980s. Okay, so before I even thought about getting saved, okay, she and Pam, Pam, that's, uh, Pam is the reason why I can't run for, for president. <laughs> okay, I'd have to get rid of Pam because Pam would have too many stories <laughs> to tell. If they ever asked her, she'd have too many stories. Marcia was the quiet one. She and Pam were, you know, best friends. But Pam, oh, my God. Oh, OK, 
Can't do that. Her and Teresa, I can never be president, okay? But she is a witness. You understand what I'm saying? They are witnesses before. Cindy and Marcia are witnesses of the United Pentecostal Church when it first got saved. So they know how this journey kind of started because they knew me before Torah. When I first got saved, before Torah, Renee, okay, Renee and actually Aquila, when we first started coming into Torah, but Renee from like the early 2000s, it was 2000 that I met, okay, Brother Harris and brought the Torah, okay, to you guys. So when we first started, and I first started teaching the Torah, Renee was one of the first ones, okay, with that. And then uh, Detroit, uh, then Aquila in Detroit, okay, came along also when we first got involved with a, a certain person and I started going to Detroit teaching. So I'm looking here and saying the sweat popping off of my off of my brow because I got all God put all of these witnesses. <laughs> okay, <laughs> these witnesses, you better get it straight. <laughs> okay, you better get it right. Why? Because you will know based upon certain things, whether it is truth or error, okay, whether it is truth or error, you know how far we have gone, guys, I want you to, oh, God, I feel like getting up and dancing right now, I really feel like getting up and dancing, okay, how far God has brought all of us, hallelujah, how far he has brought all of us, you know, and I, I think, I think I see Marcia, this makes me want to cry, you know, because I know where God brought me from. You know, I know where he brought me from. They know where God brought me from and the things that I used to do and everything. They know the grace and mercy of God and how God can change them. Don't tell me what God can't do. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me how God can't change your life Hallelujah. because I know that God, if yeah, he yeah. has a plan for your, for your life, he will change you. He will give you a new name. He'll give you a new spirit. I know he can because I know, I know what he did in my life. I know what he did in my life, Lord. And that's not to say sometimes the old man does come out. <laughs> Sometimes the old man will remind me, but then I look on the screen. Hallelujah. I look on the screen and all I see is grace and mercy in your faces. That's all I can see is grace and mercy because we've been through it, guys. We have been through something and we still stand there. We are still, each of us got a testimony. We are still standing, hallelujah. We stand as a witness for each other. Okay, how God has brought us through. How God, I'm talking to you on Facebook, on Facebook, on YouTube, wherever you are listening right now. God can bring you through because we got stories here of the hell that God reached down and brought us through. Mm -hmm, okay, amen. that brought us through. Hallelujah. Don't get me started. Here's the Pentecostal coming out. I forgot I got some Pentecostals here. That's spirit. Hallelujah. Let's go on back with Nuggets, Katrina. Okay. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Praise the Most High, yeah, hallelujah. He has brought us through, hallelujah. All of us, like you said, all of us have a story that the Father has, you know, he reached down and said, you, I'm going to change you. I'm going to fix you. I'm going to do this with you because you got to do something for me, hallelujah. Oh, glory. Yes, 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 yes. The Father is awesome. He was, and, and I used to say, Father, me, me? And be like, yeah, no, I'm not perfect. I don't do nothing perfect. You're the only one that's perfect. Um, example, yesterday I was doing something and I said, the father, it don't look right. He says, I'm the only one that's perfect. I said, that's what I'm gonna say, hallelujah. If anybody see this, <laughs> I said, I'm not perfect. The father is perfect, hallelujah. And going back to... Matthew, um, honor your mother and father. I was told by my sis, you honor my mother. My mother was um example. My mother, she honored her mother and father. She she did the best she could, one hundred percent with us, and 
she was right there with us. And my father, he passed when I was younger. But my father, he tried to be there. But the mother was always the rock. She was always the rock. And I was just telling my aunt, I said, because um, she was telling me about how this mother did this and that. I said, you know what? They always say it's mother's baby, but father's maybe. Because sometimes the father would be there to take care of the child, and sometimes he wouldn't. So that's what she was like, oh, yes, that's right. Because I was giving her an example of what the father was telling me, and she was speaking to me. But honor your mother and father. And, and when you said, when you honor your mother and father, you're honoring the father. You all in Yahweh, hallelujah. I have did my best to the most utmost since now to honor my mother and father and do as much as I could. But I mean, it's just awesome. And you, you are just awesome. I just thank the father for you, for all the knowledge he give you for us to learn. It's so much. I had to go back through this and listen to it because it was just so awesome. Here I think I'm I'm looking at this, I'm like, whoop, and then I'm not something else. And I'm like, oh whoop. I was like, okay, hold up. So I'm, I'm gonna go yeah. back and I'm like I said, I'm chewing on it now, right now. That's just say I'm chewing on it now. But the father, he is awesome. He and he have, like you said, he have bought us through a lot. But we still here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I was telling sis, I said I worked last night. I had a long, long, long night. But the father was there. I made it through his grace and mercy. Hallelujah. It was just, it was nobody but him. He's good all the time. I take nothing from him. All I can do is say, I praise you all the time. Mm -hmm. The good, the bad. You got to praise him. You got to stay in this race. It's not easy, but you got to stay in this race. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. I thank you. I love you. you all. Y'all be blessed. Amen, amen, amen. Detroit. Again? Yeah, again. Okay, then. Detroit. Let's see here. Well, I talked about the immorality in the church before they, you know, go out to the um, community. And there's been a lot of talk out there in the media about women not being able to come together or wear certain things on their heads. The other thing about men having more than one wife, I have a person close to me that he insists that he can do that. Mm. And he's still confused today. You talk about him, not just on that topic, but on other topics. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's kind of good to be able to have something so we can help people to get their lives ready because the Most High is trying to give us another warning. COVID was something, but I think what's coming next is going to be more than something. Yes. And not only, and it's going to, I think it's going <laughs> to, like they say, Start in the church and go on over. And so I treasure these moments that the Most High has given you to feed us, to help prepare us for what is coming spiritually and naturally. And I thank you for all you sacrifice and for all my brothers and sisters who are so loving and so supportive. And thank you for praying for my grandbaby as well. Amen, amen, amen. Cindy. And also, oh, Pastor, I remember years ago, I think it was 2007 maybe or eight. It could have been 2003. I don't know. But I remember uh, being on teaching with you. I met you in Florida at a conference. And I remember being on teaching with you. And I remember going to listen to you and in Ohio, and we kept you all day, all day, all night. 
we would not move. So the brothers, the pastor of the church and the brothers had to go out and get carry out food for us <laughs> because we were determined to get this word so we can understand it and do it and teach others to do it. And I so appreciate you and I thank the most high for you. You are a blessing to the world. Thank you. That was 2003. Yeah, it was 2003. Okay, yep. I thought it was. It was 2003. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And it's been a long time and I could see the change. I can see the development. I could just see the, you know, what's going on. You know, you prayed that y'all teach us something that we did not know. And he's certainly doing it day by day, even as far as when you first said a year or so ago. Mm -hmm. Thank the most high. And I love my brothers and sisters. Shalom to you all. Amen. 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 Cindy, can you uh, talk? Then we'll go to Lena and then Boise. Oh, Cindy, she might not be able to talk. Okay, Lena. Okay, um, today remind me of my <clears throat> my life with words like praise, um, trauma, rejoice, uh, love, honor, service things like that, praise, because I didn't know the Lord, and he's my creator, so I praise him for that, that I'm, I was birthed, and I'm here right now, I'm not just an entity somewhere in space or whatever, so I'm now a human being, trauma gave me the meaning of forgiveness and that's what God wants us to do also to forgive somebody which gives us joy and that's why we rejoice gladness and to heal to heal means you you put away the trauma that you experience to this is to me is to go on with your life you're healing, and it's all because of the Lord, my Creator. And love is to love Him and serve Him. And last of all, last of it's first, but it's, I put it as last is to honor, honor Him, and honor anybody that uh, believes in Him, and honor your parents, like He said. So that's the lesson I got from today's Torah portion. Thank you for you and Ed. Hallelujah. You know, when the word says, when mother and father forsake you, Yahweh will lift you up. Do you know there are more descriptions of Yahweh as a mother than a father? Yeah. He bears us on eagle's wings. He yeah. covers us. Yeah. Okay. He nurses us. You see, and then he's that father also. So he is that mother that we, if you don't have a mother, he becomes that mother to you to take care of you. If you don't have the father, he becomes that father, okay, uh, 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 to you and everything. So, you know, that that was good. Very good. Uh, let me go, Renee Boise. Well, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Pass the powerful message. And it, I mean, the things that come to my my, as you were sharing with everybody after the service, from the service, from the the things about what we did not know that they actually twisted and and made us misunderstand the the role of women in men in ministry and powerful. But the thing that's so powerful is when you say, "Look where I was, look what I was," yet he still reached out to pick me up bring me to himself. And the thing that came to my, my, my spirit is just look at the, the people. I think about Isaiah. He he was amongst his people. And when he saw the glory of the Most High, man, he went. He was horrified at his own unrighteousness. And then what the Most High do, he, he sent a seraphim, not just a regular angel, just a seraphim to go to the coals, to go to the altar. They get a live cold, 
not a dead cold, a, cold, a live cold, to touch his lips to heal him. Then the man, I think about Peter, he was in the boat. Yeshua came in and preached. He told Yeshua, he said, leave me a sinner, master. Leave me a sinner. Then, man, you go back, you go to Paul, persecuting Christian, on the road to Emmaus. The Most High put him down. Matter of fact, even before that, he was telling them one of the, his followers said, hey, Lord, don't you know he trying to, he persecuted him. He said, hey, but he's going to be a vessel unto me. And then on the way to Emmaus, guess what? He he found the true and living Yeshua, the, the living God. In the midst of doing his wrong. And I look at these people. And then let's go to uh, our, our king, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. He said, I am. This is mine. The most I put him to shame, made him made his mind turn into animal. Among that, then he woke up and said, Hey, I know the glory of the most high. He is, he is king, he is God. And it's so powerful. But where we was, look what we don't deserve none of this. But his grace and mercy, and I love what Yeshua said, if you love me. If you love me, obey my command, and my sheep will hear my voice. We don't know who's the sheep of the most high. I didn't know I was the sheep of the most high until I opened my heart. And then he brought me into himself. And so, again, it's just he's worthy. He's worthy. Everything that you shared about the church, you know, what Ed shared about the, the command. When you want and love the most high so much. He'll give you an understanding. He'll wake you up to a reality of a relationship that he is setting apart his people of all around the world that loves him as a, a relation, a God of relationship, not a God of a religion. And I think that's where Christianity and all these religions fail. They try to base everything on their teachings or whatever theology, but it's a relationship. When you have that relationship, he will bring everything into your remembrance through the right condition, the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Um, once again, that was such an on-time word um, with women in the ministry and the things that you're going to run into, things you're going to see. Um, as you were, were teaching, pastors, I cannot lie, for a brief second, I could see my grandmother. And in the sense of the teachings and the things that you were saying, and even some of the mannerisms, and it, it really touched my heart because I remember remember so many things in that it, there was the times where the men felt like that the women couldn't speak or teach or preach, and they were humble, and they would do the things that the Father would give them to do, but, but the most I would always justify it. And at the end, you know, it changed. Um, and it's just preparing my heart for things that are coming. And I heard that word, it hit on so many levels um, with some upcoming things that are coming up. And I'm so grateful for the word. That word is, is true. He kept telling me I'm the way, the truth, and the light. The way, the truth, and the light. And when I first heard it, Pastor, when you were teaching, I heard him say, direct, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the emet, and the life, I'm the kayin. I'm all of it. I'm all of it, all that you would have me to be. And then the example you just gave just a moment ago when you said, there are more examples in the scripture with the most high being a mother to us than a father. And then I heard in my spirit, that's why male and female created I, them mm -hmm. from the beginning, male and female, the one, the Adam, the oneness, because I'm one all mm -hmm. the way through. So thank you so, so very much. My parents said, hello, they love you. Um, and DJ and Kayla as well. That's why I was getting up and, and back there in the Virgin Islands. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> yeah, should they, they want a trip. Uh, but something happened. So that's why I had to leave and make sure, but they're okay. Um, okay. But um, again, we love you very, very much. And thank you for that word. Um, again, my parents love you very much. So I'm hoping and praying. I know we're coming down that way soon. But the time is going to come. You're going to come this way or, or else we're going to come get you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Isaiah told me to ask you, uh, send me exactly where you're staying so he can check it out for you. Oh, OK. We'll do. We'll do. OK. Right. Yeah. Marcia Austin. And Lena, thank you for the cookies. The cookie jar is full. <laughs> 
And I'm taking some to Sierra Leone with me. I packed up some so that I can have them on the plane. Oh, okay, too. So take some. Don't, but please don't forget about the presentation. I got an update when you get a chance offline. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Marcia Austin. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. I was hoping you wouldn't um, call my name. <laughs> I'd be in the background just listening. <laughs> uh, I'm like six sister nugget. I don't like to give nuggets. I'm shy. <laughs> well, thank you, Pastor Israel. Thank you so much. Um, I was just thinking about you uh, when you were at Chase Bank. Oh. And uh, the, Lord, the Lord had a word for you that you were going to be in ministry full time. And you said, huh, it really has to be the Lord because uh, I don't know about pastoring. And uh, I don't know where the money is coming from, but I just think about how God worked it out for you because you, you did resign and, and you, you managed without a paycheck coming in from Chase Manhattan Bank. And look at how God worked it out, worked it out for you from then to now, you know. So I just want to say thank you for all that you do for us. Uh, I'm grateful that you was talking about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Nazarenes. All these different sects, there's so much different things, and uh, you just break it down uh, a bit more for me to understand. So thank you for that. And you also mentioned assignments. So, you know, God would have us in a place, and he would have witnesses there, you are as, as a witness. And when it's time for you to leave, he lets you know to leave, because sometimes they may have you rejected, reject you because of color, because of uh, your beliefs in your so um, I have someone who's dealing with that, and we talk about it a lot. So uh, you even confirm a bit more about that. And I also thought, thought about Hermine. How she said she's been through so many uh, different religions. It's so much to even think about or talk about. As uh, We went through the same thing to my sister and I, as a family, my grandmother. Had different people come into our homes talking about, you know, uh, Christianity, we had Jehovah Witness, we had, well, we, we were um, Catholics as growing up in, in the Catholic church and went to school as Catholic school, so we grew up with that too, and all the different religions, and I remember telling my grandmother, I said, this is confusing, but I was about 12 years old, I remember that, I said, this is confusing, I don't, we don't know which one to choose or where to go, you have them all coming here, and she said, ask the Lord to reveal the truth to you and he'll show you the truth. And that's what I did as a, as a young uh, child. And uh, here I am today. And I, I tell my son, I said, I always remember praying that prayer. And I said, look what God has done now. After all of these different religions, I ended up where I'm sh I should be hearing the truth and learning the truth. So thank you so much, Pastor Israel. Amen. 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 Here is an instruction for you, Marcia. You need to take a day off, yeah. okay, to get some rest, <laughs> okay? God does have something for you, a word for you, but he can't give it to you. Your mind is too active. That is one reason why okay. the enemy has attacked you the way that he has, because of something that God, a word that God has for you. Give to the people. But your mind is too active. You're too tired to hear him the way he needs you to hear him. Take And when you take a day off, like going on vacation, that is not a vacation. You're still doing a lot of running around and everything. You need to take a day off or two off to just rest. Shut yourself up and rest. Okay. So that you can hear. I'm hearing that very clearly. Yes. I will. Thank you, Pastor. I will. You know, and I know you, 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 you f kind of feel an unction as frustrating because you're tired, but you know there's something else. It's like an irritation almost. <laughs> okay, in the spirit, you get so busy you don't yes. think about it. Okay, but take that time off because it's very important. You know, and All that's right. what, that I will. is what that is what is giving the enemy access to you. Okay, right now with regards <laughs> to your health. So take that time off. All right. Take that time off. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank All you. All right, Mary. Brad Thank and Jenny, you. I know know you were thinking I was going to forget you. <laughs> That's okay. You didn't have to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I was kind of thinking about the roles of the women, and it was just kind of interesting to you know, to, to see the research and stuff that you can research this and see that there's no evidence that, you know, you know, supports this. And um, it's just like, it's just like kind of how every other thing is like, whoever starts this idea and then you have all these like, you know, you know, you know, uh, you know, followers who just run with the idea and they keep doing it for years to come, you know, year after year. Um, and then like it doesn't even help too when like you have like Hollywood who is like, you know, they can reach a lot of, you know, people, but they they you know, they make all these like, you know, shows and and movies about God and, and that view is in there, like, you know, they're I mean, you know, all the, you know, women are at home, uh, cleaning, you know, handling the household, and then the guys are the ones who, who are out and, like, you know, stuff at the, uh, you know, synagogue. So even, like, in Hollywood, like, in, in, you know, enforces all these, these wrong ideas. And if you don't, like, read the Bible, then you assume they're they're right, you know, like you and like if you don't do your piece arch, you assume they're you know that they're right. So it's just it's just interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Jenny, um, let's see you have uh, we make plans and God laughs, <laughs>, <laughs> and then you know like a lot of others mention about honoring your mother and father because if you don't it's like not honoring Yahweh which makes sense I mean if he can't even trust you to honor your earthly authority how can he trust you to honor him you know your heavenly authority so it makes a lot of sense you know everything with him is always order and not chaos and you know Adam and Eve were equals that's his formula and everybody wants to mess with his formula so, so. mm-hmm yeah, that's all I got. Thank you. Amen. You know, I want you to think about this. When you get married, you stood before someone, okay, and you stood before someone to take a vow, right? Yeah. And that vow, you made that vow to God. Am I right? Mm -hmm. So let me ask you something. If someone stands before God and takes a vow and they do not honor a vow they made to God, why do you think they're going to honor a promise that they make to you? No. Think about it. Think about it. You know, and that that's something that is uh, um, just something to think about. If you can't keep, either you don't fear God or you don't believe in God. You know, and that's part of that, you know, uh, 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 I am the Lord that God don't have any other idols. Because when you have an idol, you put the word of that idol above the word of God, you know, with that. So that's why we have to be uh, uh, so careful. There's something that Brad had said that I can't remember right now. I'll probably think about it tonight. It'll wake me up at three o'clock in the morning and I won't go back to sleep again. So you might get another service called Blame It on Brad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, okay, I think that is it. Okay, with everyone, this has been a, a, a really good day. I hope you have a really, really good day because I know I'm about to go relax. Um, I am doing your tax offerings as we speak. Okay, so I should have them hopefully by tomorrow. Okay, all of the receipts out tomorrow on Monday. I want to get them done before I leave, you know, and everything. So just know that I'm I'm working on that along with, 500 other, you know, other things. Keep me in prayer. I got a lot of things that um, I have to get done before next week because I'm leaving actually next week, next Tuesday. Okay, not this Tuesday coming up, but next Tuesday. Okay, I will be on a plane. We will not have revelation study for those uh, particular, let me give you the dates of no revelation study right now. 
Okay, that will be February 15th, February 22nd, and February 29th. All right, I will be on, uh, I'm going to try to be on service for February 17th, that sat Saturday, because Let's see, there's five hours different. So I should be finished with the Freetown service and it's five o'clock, will be five o'clock. So, you know, I will do all the lessons and everything and get them to you. If I'm not on right away, okay, uh, or if something comes up, I will text you because a lot of it depends upon whether or not I can get internet. Okay, get internet from uh, uh, Freetown. So the 17th, I should be on the 24th, I will probably not be on because I think we have a class, Helping Babies Breathe class. The second, I will uh, uh, probably be on because I'm leaving on the third to come back and to get home on the fourth. Okay, so those are the dates that, you know, uh, uh, we will either have no service or an abbreviated, you know, an abbreviated service for that. And I appreciate all of you, you know, stepping up and everything, especially on the 24th. On the 24th, I may give some extra readings or whatever, uh, depending upon how it goes uh, with that. We start our outreach on the 19th, actually the 18th, because we'll be packing up. I don't know. I think I sent you guys um, pictures that are on um Hebrew Institute, hopefully there, I think I sent them to Brad to put on Hebrew Institute, but we have 15 pallets of uh, uh, pharmaceuticals from uh, direct relief and several other suitcases and stuff uh, of uh, uh, also medications that are going over. The pallets from direct relief, that was $5.75 million worth of pharmaceuticals. Okay, that we are sending over. So keep all of that in prayer. Uh, <laughs> you guys that went over before, imagine having to pack all of that because guess what? That's what we have to do. Okay, we're going to be doing that on that Sunday before. We're going to be packing some of that stuff or unpacking it and putting it in packages because we anticipate, you know, seeing maybe about 2,000, 3,000 people. So we have to have a pharmacy ready, which is why I wish all of you were going back with me again. <laughs> okay, because we need help. Okay, we definitely need help. Okay, uh, uh, with that again. So get ready for maybe next year. Okay, maybe next year, sometime next year, you know, for the, uh, if we go on an outreach. Next year, either go on an outreach or going uh, for one of the feast days. Okay, one of the feast days. I'm going to try to pack in my bag some real matzah, okay, uh, uh, for them for Passover so that they will have real matzah, okay, for for Passover and everything. So uh, I already, and, and uh, tell Rich, his suitcase came right on time. I packed up about 480 hats. Okay, in that suitcase. I was able to get he, that. He heard you. Oh, okay. And then had to sit on it to close it. <laughs> I'm laying on the suitcase trying to zip it up. Please don't bust. Okay, these uh, 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 zippers and everything. But it weighed less than uh, 50 pounds. It weighed less than 40 pounds, actually all 500 of those hats. So I have two other suitcases that I have to pack. You know, I'll be taking about three suitcases. So I'm going to be paying mega bucks, okay, for these suitcases. Thank goodness two of them are free. So that third one, I'm going to try to pack everything just within my clothes and everything within two suitcases, you know, so that uh, I don't have to pay too much extra, you know, for that. But we do have the hats that are all passed up. Those are the hats that were crocheted by Sister Linda, you know, from Calvary. Okay, Sister Linda, she did 500 hats this time. She did about five or 600 hats before. So she has crocheted probably close to about 1,200 hats for the kids in Sierra Leone. Okay, so keep her in prayer. She just loves to do that, you know, and she also did the outfits and everything. I have some outfits to take over for the kids 
that she sewed. She also donated a uh, sewing machine, which I'm going to try to find. I got about five or six boxes in here that need to be packed up in barrels. As soon as I find someone who will ship for me, they will be getting a suitcase. One of the things I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be meeting with the older children. Okay, with the older children. Okay, I purchased a, I think it is a fire tablet, okay, uh, uh, for them so that they will have, you know, a tablet there at their home that they have. I want to thank Boise and Renee for, you know, I'm giving the, the older children a certain amount, okay, of money. They've never had anything that says, hey, this is for you, okay, right here. Some of those kids now, they're between 18 and maybe 22 years old but we're still keeping them because I'm not turning none of those kids out into the street until we know that they are stable. Some of them, the uh, older kids, the only home that they've had for, since they were about six or seven years old was that home. I can't turn them out into the streets, not knowing what's going to happen to them. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have 39, we started with 25 guys. We started with 25 kids back in two, uh, 2020, we're now up to 39, up to 39 kids. So we are sending more. Okay. We send over a thousand dollars a month for their care plus, uh, of their, uh, you know, some of their schooling and also housing and everything. So I want to thank all of you guys for, you know, uh, being faithful, just being faithful to what God tells you to do. That's all you can ask. And he takes it and he does marvelous things. Okay, in the lives of uh, people and everything. So I'm going to take uh, funds over there because since I couldn't send the barrels, okay, I need to purchase things for the kids, okay, over there. So I'll be taking some funding for that that we already have in the bank and everything. I already have it in the bank, you know, that I'll be taking over, you know, over there to get them some things, you know, that they'll need and then to give the others a, a kind of stipend for themselves. They can do whatever they want to. It's equivalent of $50 a piece. That's not a lot of money. But when our kids have a birthday or something, don't we sometimes give them a little something, something, a little, a little something, something, put in your hand. You know how grandma used to put that in your hand? Here, baby, this is for you. Don't tell your mother. Okay. <laughs> You know, Grandma used to do that. Don't tell yeah. nobody. I gave yeah. this to you. And she ball it up and put it in your hand. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what all of you are doing. We're balling it up and putting it in the hand. Okay, and I'm telling them, this is just for you. You want to tell nobody about it. This is just for you. Okay, because some of them have never had anybody. Just give them something for them. We take so much for granted. Our kids are spoiled rotten. Okay, but that's what I want to do. I want to show them that kind of love. What they do, if they want to go buy a pair of sneakers, go ahead and buy a pair of sneakers. If you want to start a business, start a business. Whatever you want to do with this, this is for you to do something, something with it. You know, to show the love that you are loved, you are special. And people, there are people that care, okay, that care about you. So I'll go over there. I'm going to talk to them, see about career pathing, how I can get some people, you know, involved with them. This, this sewing machine we're sending over, we have a couple of them that are going to tailoring school. So they will have their own. So I want them to have their own sewing machine that if they want to start their own tailoring business, they will have a sewing machine to do that. Okay, uh, with the nurses, I'm going to try to get connected to Healthcare Sierra Leone and some of the offices over there. We have some that are going in for, uh, um, for catering. I want to try to get them connected with some caterers, even if it is maybe the hotels or someone over there where they will have jobs. So this is what I'm on a mission, guys, okay, uh, to do the same things we have over here. I also will probably be meeting with my extended family over there, the Elliots, okay? What I found out from them is that most of the Elliots were all pastors. They were all, so when, I, when they heard that I was in the ministry, they go, oh yeah, she's an Elliot, all right. Okay, <laughs> they all pastors. Elliot means yeah, it's a derivative of Elijah. Yahweh is my God. Elijah means Yahweh is my God. Eliot is the plural, okay, of that. So Yahweh is our God. All right. And so I'm looking at the Bible college. 
One of my uh, uh, descendants back in the 1700s uh, started a church over there that is still in existence. And I'm saying to myself, Lord, is this where you want the Bible college started? Okay, with the Elliots, Yahweh, Yahweh is our God. It will be totally Hebrew because that's how they started. Okay, my grand uncle and great grand uncle always thought, said that the family was Hebrews. Didn't understand that till it came into Torah. So I'll see, I'll let you know. We may be on a new adventure. Okay, with this Bible college. Okay, starting a Bible college in a church. Okay, in a church over there. So a lot of good things that are going to be going on. You know, so keep me in a prayer. You know, keep me in prayer for a healing of this back. Okay, and everything. So Grace, I need, well, Grace is gone. I needed her to come on over. <laughs> okay, with me. So anyway, all right, guys. Okay, may Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Shalom, shalom. All right. Give me a call if you need to for anything. And I'll see you on Thursday. We will be oh, together this Thursday. All right, Pastor. All right. Still on, still on.